Hey everyone, welcome back. I haven't done a compilation in a couple of months, so I thought I'd do one. It's over three hours of scary content. I know some of you don't like these, so if you don't like them, don't worry. I'll have a new video out tomorrow. But for everyone else, here's three hours of spooky stories for you to sit back and relax too. I'll have a new video tomorrow. And until then, enjoy. And remember, to always, stay hungry. My boyfriend C and I have been together for eight years. In the spring of 2019, we decided to finally find an apartment and move in together. We're both college students and we didn't have a ton of money, so our options were limited. While searching, I came across a relatively cheap studio apartment in downtown Minneapolis, only a five minute bus ride from my college. After talking it all over, we decided that this was the place. While it was in a sketchy neighborhood, we were smart kids and knew how to keep safe. Our parents were a little nervous, but nevertheless supportive. We moved in two weeks before my 21st birthday. We were so excited to finally have a place of our own and it didn't matter how small or dingy. Anyway, as time went on, we began to realize why the apartment was so cheap. We would often need our apartment to be fumigated for roaches, appliances wouldn't work, druggies would break into the building, and packages would be stolen. All of this was upsetting, but things that could be ignored. Things are going fine until the summer of 2020. Over the summer, my boyfriend and I decided to move in with my parents while keeping our apartment. With the pandemic raging, we knew we would want to be able to see our families and we thought the communal living wouldn't be the safest of choices. While we were gone, new tenants had moved in. When we came back in early August, we discovered that the couple across the hall from us had moved and a new woman had taken her place. We'll call her Nancy. Now, Nancy was a middle-aged woman. I'd like to say early 30s, but with all the drugs we later came to find out she was doing, it was really hard to tell her real age, seeing as they had aged her quite a bit. It took a while for us to realize that our previously quiet neighbors had moved and Nancy had taken their place. After passing her in the hallway and watching her enter her apartment, we came to understand, but that's when things got weird. We noticed a man coming around the apartment late at night. He wasn't a tenant, and he made it clear by banging on the outside door. He would yell and kick at the door and scream for Nancy to come let him in. At first, we thought he may be her boyfriend, but we could tell quite quickly that that was not the case. We emailed management about this, as he kept coming around very late at night, and our window overlooked the door. We could see anyone and everyone who would come and go. They thanked us for notifying them and to keep them updated as necessary. This was on the 13th of August. The second incident happened on August 20th. By now, we have met both Nancy and Nancy's boyfriend, Justin. Nice enough people. They kept to themselves, but they liked to party. On August 20th, around dinner time, there was a very loud pounding on our hallway door. It's a big metal door that management had installed a lock on to lessen the chances of homeless getting into the hallway of residences. The banging went on for a good five minutes and consisted of shouting and threats. It was hard not to notice. Eventually, we heard Justin let the gentleman in and we then realized it was the same man as before. Justin denied the man entry into their apartment, going as far as to lock him out of their door. The men then began kicking their door and then telling them to open the fuck up. Justin did, but left the slide lock on. At this point, my boyfriend was watching the interaction through the peephole, and he watched this gentleman pull a gun out of his pants and then flash it to Justin. The door was then shut and unlocked. The man entered, and the night was quiet. A little shaken, we considered calling the cops, but instead, decided to simply email management. To this, we got no reply. Just a short three days later though, August 23rd, 
We did, however, decide to call the cops. This time, the same thing happened, but the gentleman was never let into the apartment, and he pulled the weapon out in the hall, claiming he was going to shoot. He left before the police arrived. Again, we emailed management and received no response. By now, we were getting pretty nervous, as our neighbors were a clear threat to us. Now, in between the last event and the one I'm going to detail, there were many shouting matches between Nancy and Justin. Many more times did their friend come back and make a scene, but it was very much the same as before, including but not limited to breaking our hallway door by kicking it and pulling off the handle. Now, September 8th, this happened, and it's one of the three events that has made me jump every time I hear a loud noise. Around noon, I was in class, on Zoom of course, and from my desk with my headphones on, I could hear another fight ensuing across the hall. I prayed for it to be something that ended as soon as it started, but I was not so lucky. Within literally minutes, the fight escalated from screaming to then hitting, punching, and throwing. Nancy was screeching that she was going to kill Justin and that he was killing her. Shakily, my boyfriend went to the door to get a better idea of the seriousness of this fight. After she continued screaming, I decided to call 911, explaining to the operator that once again the tenants were fighting, and she told me the cops were on their way. Then, there was a noisy thwack and loud scream. Before we hung up, Justin swung open the door with blood pouring from his head. I informed the operator that Justin was bleeding and to send an ambulance. When the first responder showed up, Nancy refused to open the door. The cops were talking to her through the door, and she kept insisting that it wasn't them that had been fighting. This may have been believable had there not been a trail of blood leading from their doorway. After about 10 minutes, Nancy finally let them in, and she then explained that she had been liking you guys' photos on Facebook, and Justin got jealous. So he then threw her phone, leading them to get into a fight. One thing led to another, and she picked up a hammer and hit him on the head. No charges were filed, and everyone went on with their day as if nothing had ever happened. I, on the other hand, was traumatized. No more than a week later, Justin was back at the apartment. Their nightly fights continued, and you could almost hear a collective groan of all of our neighbors the night he came back. We later came to learn that Justin was never actually a tenant, only Nancy was, and that they were likely doing favors for their friend. We saw him come around occasionally, but not as often as before. He did, however, manage to get a key. He always came with an empty duffel bag and left with a filled one. I had the suspicion that they were working with drugs and that he was the dealer. Anyways, on September 16th, the morning after my 22nd birthday, I woke up at around 8 a.m. to a quiet sobbing sound. I couldn't exactly distinguish who it was or where it was coming from. I was a bit hungover, and I wasn't sure if I was fully awake. I walked to our window to get a better breeze in when I noticed three cop cars outside of our building. They were all standing there questioning Justin. Oh great, I thought to myself. I walked to our door, where sure enough stood Nancy giving a tearful story to an officer. I shook my head and I decided to go back to bed. Around that day, I was again in class when a loud shriek broke the silence. My stomach dropped and I got a weird feeling. C walked over to the door and heard a few people in panicked voices from across the hall. There's a woman crying over there, he told me. I want to go check on her. She sounds hurt. I got up and checked and I heard it too. There was also a man saying, Fuck! Fuck! What now? And a shout. No. I told him. Call the cops. You don't know what's going on. Within minutes, cops had arrived. C had just gotten off the phone with the dispatcher when six cop cars and an ambulance pulled up. The cops and paramedics were led into the building by one of the downstairs tenants and escorted up to the apartment. Within minutes... A woman was escorted out on a gurney bleeding heavily from a stab wound in her abdomen. 
Will later came to find out that neither Nancy or Justin had been home, but the three of their friends had been there hanging out. One gentleman was tweaking on whatever they were dealing with, and he got upset by something the woman had said, so he stabbed her. Until we called management, they had no idea what happened. When they came to visit Nancy to inform her that one more strike and she'd be evicted, she cursed at them through the door and told them to be more compassionate. I was irate. The last straw came not even a week later. At 4.42 a.m. on September 19th, I then woke up to a blood-curdling scream of Nancy. I leapt out of bed, shaking. I grabbed my phone and tearfully begged the dispatcher to tell the officers to hurry. The screaming went on for about 20 minutes before an officer arrived. Again, like all the times before, C went down and let the officer in. He pounded on the door and demanded to be let in. Both Justin and Nancy denied him entrance. Furious, I thought like all the times before, the officer would simply walk away. But this time, he took action. This time, he told them they would either open the door or he would kick it down, as he was the first officer to ever actually be present for their arguments, and that he heard claims that Justin was going to kill her. Within two days, Nancy was evicted. I'm still really afraid that she'll send someone after us since she knows we got them evicted, as the last officer didn't make it so secretive as to who called and reported them. While she was friendly to our face, we could hear her making threats after each time the cops had been called. I'm excited to say that after I graduate this spring, we will be moving, and hopefully never have to experience these kind of things ever again. If only we knew a short year later, that very same complex would be shot up by none other than our upstairs neighbor. Thankfully, however, we moved out eight months before that occurred. The man described as Daryl, my dad's old high school buddy. The 40-something-year-old antagonist of one of my life's more traumatic events, which all took place back in 2015. It was a warm, fragrant springtime afternoon, and I was an 18-year-old kid coming home from a day of class at the local community college, coming home to my dad's anarchist trap house that my friend and I decided to move into as roommates a year before. It was a small, one-story downtown house in an upscale neighborhood, and it had five to seven vagabond guests or couch surfers at any given time. That's up to 10 people under one roof, or two if you count the shed. Conflict was inevitable. I entered in through the side gate, from the well-manicured street facing front into the neglected, junk-filled back. There he was, sitting at his crooked, worn-out metal table placed right in my path to the bent-up screen door. Daryl was dressed in his finest, filthy brown hobo jacket as he carved his latest piece of stick art. He looked up at me with glazed eyes and an absent expression. This struck me as odd, since although he was weird, he wasn't usually this weird. When I looked closer at his table, I saw why. Along with his usual random pieces of metal and rocks that he used for his wands, there was a blackened glass tube, a lighter, and a four-fifths empty gallon jug of rock gut gin the gin that I had watched him bring home with him the night before. The night before, he had been partying, having fun, and acting fairly normal, but the presence of the charged straight shot glass pipe on the table explained how he stayed awake this whole time. The contents of this pipe, which were soaked into a screen made from the strands of a copper wire scrubber, can be deduced logically. Yeah, crack cocaine. I gave Daryl a modest greeting, to which he then responded with an awkward head movement and an unfriendly grunt, as he then continued to aggressively carve the stick. His body language gave me a dark vibe, full of animosity. What I experienced while walking in was unusual, but nothing too crazy to me. I've seen worse in that house, and I had such a chip on my shoulder. I was almost itching for some kind of altercation to take my anger out on, at least on a daily basis. If this was my opportunity to protect my territory, I would do it with pleasure. I was a massive stoner and a bit of an alcoholic at the time, and upon arriving home, I usually would have stopped by my friend's room to say hi and smoke a bowl or two, 
but he was at his mom's house that night, which meant that, unfortunately, he was not able to witness the events that would be taking place over the following couple of hours. And although I did have substance abuse issues, I was still an honor roll student. So instead of smoking a bowl, I went straight back to my room to get some economics homework done. I had worked for about 45 minutes before focusing became impossible due to loud noises and all of the yelling from the kitchen, which was just beyond the hallway entrance, mere feet from my bedroom door. This was simply not something I could tolerate, so I grabbed my 2009 digital camera, as I didn't have a smartphone back then, and I made my way to the heart of the commotion. Holding my camera, I entered the kitchen to find my dad and his two tough biker friends huddled together near the sink. Daryl had more or less cornered them. His arms were outstretched, making his hobo jacket appear like brown wings as he held up his largest stick in one hand, like Rafiki's staff in The Lion King. When I had walked in, I said nothing to alert him to my presence. I simply held up the camera to record him as he then verbally spilled his darkest demons on all of us. He was belligerently screaming at my dad and his friends, but his biggest target was Joe, our lovable old biker dude who had been my dad's friend my whole life and who had never treated Daryl with anything but friendliness and respect. Daryl was just screaming about how he was a racist while Joe continued to deny it, raising his voice to match it. While I can't speak for Joe's personal beliefs, I will emphasize that Daryl didn't face any sort of discrimination under our roof. I mean, he may have felt disrespected at times, but his behavior was often unacceptable, and any confrontation was well-deserved. During one of his loud, drunken, barely coherent rants, Daryl had begun hitting all of the wooden cabinets with his stick, pairing his screaming with the crazed rhythms of a wild man. I continued to hold the camera out towards him, making no attempt to hide it or leave the room, all the while he creeped his way towards me, whacking each cabinet along the way. Now, you may see me as naive and crazy to do this, but I was filled with excitement. My desire to record him was mainly for evidence, but it was also partly inspired by my love for the YouTuber McJuggernuggets, aka Psycho Kid. He turned his head to face mine at an unnatural speed. His face then scrunched into a scowl as he laid eyes on me and my camera. With his rock gun gin breath, he got up in my face, waving his stick around in hand, as if this was to threaten me. Get that camera out of my face, boy! He slurred. I cursed back at him in defiance and held firm as he tried to grab it from me. We wrestled back and forth from my green digital camera for about 10 seconds as it continued to record. Fortunately, I was able to get it back. And as I did, he moved to get close and intimidate me again, more aggressively now. Even though he was 10 inches taller than me, a 10-year-old me had a tendency to be numb about situations like this, and my fear response had lessened with time. Having spent the previous three and a half years self-harming and on the edge of unaliving myself, I had already embraced death. This wasn't the only time I put myself in dangerous situations that year, almost hoping for violence. I was also incredibly territorial and protective of my family and all the people I care for, and being extremely insecure, I was very sensitive to any perceived disrespect to myself or the house. As Daryl towered over me, my right hand rested around the closed lid of an empty cookie jar sitting on the kitchen table. At that moment, I knew that if he got out of hand, that jar would be my last resort. I loosened my grip on the jar, pushed Daryl away, and I watched him move back from me and then make his way to torment my dad and his friends again. I took this opportunity to put my camera back in my room, and I came out a minute later to find that my dad and the biker dudes had gone to my dad's back room. Daryl had gone back to his dirty mattress in the dark shadows of the living room in front of the house. Things had lulled, and I still had homework to do, so I went back to my room. About a half hour, darkness had fallen outside, and things were too quiet. Something had to be wrong. I wanted to check on my dad and his friends, so I left my room and I found myself alone in an eerie, grimy kitchen with the lights on and dark windows facing the night. 
There was a soft mumbling to my right. Dara was kneeling in the dim rays of light, cast from the kitchen to the contrasting darkness of the living room. He was holding two billiard balls that he had taken from the pool table, one in each upward-facing hand and outstretching arms. His head rolled back to face the ceiling in a perfect position to channel demons like an antenna. Like his head, his eyes were rolled back as well, with only the bloodshot whites being visible. As his head gently jerked around with his satanic mumbling, the dim light reflected off his bald scalp. His unkempt salt and pepper goatee was speckled with foamy dribble. Seconds after I saw him, he jolted into life like an animated corpse. His face then contorted into a hatred that I haven't seen before or since, as he launched toward me from a kneeled position, still holding the pool balls in each hand. Thinking quickly, I grabbed the cookie jar and with Daryl close on my tail, retreated to my dad's room. Fortunately, the lights were on, and the room had a door connecting to the backyard. He caught up to me there, so I pushed him back into the rag and wooden table in the corner, which broke under his weight. He quickly recovered, and he sneered back at me, as he then bolted from the wreckage. As he did so, I stumbled out the back door, tripped backwards down the two concrete steps, and landed on the cement patio bordering the grass. Time had condensed in that moment. All of this occurred in just a few seconds. When I landed, the cookie jar on my right had been broken, and I was bleeding heavily from a large gash in my palm, caused by the broken porcelain, but there was no pain. I wound up pitching my arm from the position on the ground, and as he was about to make his way through the back door, I then launched the jagged remnants of the cookie jar through the air. Lucky strike. The cookie jar crashed through the glass window in the back door and hit Daryl squarely on the forehead. He went limp and he collapsed into the floor of my dad's room. He didn't get up. It was his turn to bleed. Having faced this entire situation alone, I made my way to the shed to find my dad, his 60-year-old biker friend, and Joe's other biker friend. I opened the shed door, and they were all just sitting in a close circle whispering to each other. All tough men cowering in this tiny one-room living space in the corner of the yard. These three grown men left 18-year-old me all alone to fend for myself in a house with a violent psychopath. But I forgave them. They genuinely all seemed terrified, and I was thanked profusely by all of them for solving their problem. I appreciated the ego boost but we still had two problems. I was bleeding heavily, and Daryl was unconscious and bleeding twice as much as I was. I was then advised to wrap my wounds, get in my car, and drive the 25 minutes to my grandma's house in the woods. I bled in my car all the way to my grandma's house. When I was there, I soaked my wounds in soapy water, hoping to avoid getting stitches, since I still didn't know if I was considered a criminal or not and wanted to lie low. About 20 minutes into soaking, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. I had a feeling that it was related to the events that had just taken place, and I was correct. It was a deputy from the sheriff's department at the scene of the crime. I was quaking, but I explained to her exactly what happened in complete honesty. Her response filled me with lightness like a helium balloon. It was self-defense, she had said and Daryl was obviously blacked out and having a psychotic episode. According to the police, Daryl was found lying in a pool of blood on the front porch. A neighbor had called the police, and when they arrived, Daryl had woken up and began to attack them, screaming about racism. Apparently now, he believed the police were racist and that they were there to harass him. He believed that he was becoming a victim of racist police brutality, and he decided to attack the police before they attacked him. He attacked a female police officer too. Not cool. After learning that, I got back in the car to drive myself to the emergency room and continued to make a bloody mess of the whole thing for a whole 25 minutes there. That night, I stayed over at my grandma's house. When I went back to my dad's house the next day, I learned a few details from my dad about what happened after I left. Daryl had bled so much that my dad and his friends were unable to absorb it faster than it was coming out, even after using all the towels in the house. 
It was at that point where they dragged him into the front porch. They just wanted to be done with him, and they let society deal with it. Daryl got treated to the hospital himself that night, and he spent the next two weeks in jail for disorderly conduct. I'm happy to say that he never came back to our house, and I never saw him again. In a sense, my dad and his friends were right. I did solve a problem. That guy was a squatter and a menace, and now he's gone. Best part? He was so messed up on drugs he could hardly remember what happened. He thought that it was Joe the biker who hit him. He has no memory of ever fighting with me. Now, seven years later, this event still stands out to me in the story of my life. I learned a lot from spending a year living in an anarchist trap house, but the biggest thing I learned is to always stand up for yourself in your territory, even when it makes people not like you, and to always watch out for tweakers whenever they drink cheap gin. This happened about two years ago when I got a gym membership to a 24-hour gym. Normally, I would take my son with me or a friend for mutual support, as well as company, but on a few occasions, I would have to go alone. During these times, I would bring my headphones and put on some music to tune others out and to keep to myself and on task. Indeed, Everything about my body language suggested that I didn't want to be bothered or approached, but if it had stayed that way, this wouldn't be much of a story. So the first time I ventured to the gym alone, it was around 5 p.m., and I had just gotten off work. Due to the time of day, the gym was quite crowded. As I settled into a groove with my music playing and getting a good pace on my exercise bike, I heard someone saying hey rather loudly to my right. I looked and see a man in his 50s from whom I don't know and he's now motioning for me to take out my earbuds. Clearly annoyed, I take out one bud and then ask, yeah, what do you need? To which the stranger tells me that he's never seen me there before and that he'd remember me if he did. I just said, um, okay, and I proceeded to put my earbud back in and resume pedaling. Then he taps me on my shoulder. I hit pause on my New York Doll song. What? Then he says, Aw, oh, don't be like that. I just want to talk to you. It's not every day that I meet a lady as pretty as you. And I just send back, Uh, thanks, but I'm not here to socialize. Excuse me. And I walked away to an elliptical. So what does he do? He steps in front of the elliptical machine, almost straddling it to get in front of me with my foot being precariously close to his junk. Gross. Hell no. I put my foot away and glare at him. Unfazed, he remarks how strong my thighs must be, and he asks me out for a drink sometime. I flat out said to him, No, I'm not interested in you, and I'm not impressed by you, and I have a boyfriend. To my revulsion, he smiles and says, Nice try. But if you had a man, he wouldn't let you come here alone. I really had it by this time, and I got off the machine without another word, and I left for the locker room to then change and go home. As I'm getting changed, I hear a woman shout at someone, Um, excuse me, this is the ladies' locker room. You need to get out now. It's my guess and not a wild guess at who it was trying to get into the women's locker room. Obviously, after that fiasco, I left. Fast forward about two days later, and I went back. Again alone due to scheduling complications with my gym mates. But I went around noon on a Saturday, hoping to not see Creepy McCreeperson. No such luck. There he is at the front desk chatting with one of the male workers. I should have left, but I wanted to get some exercise in. And I told myself that if he starts in again, I'm going to report him to the gym workers. I approach the front desk to check in. The man then suddenly hoists himself up and leans over the front desk, trying to see my name or address on the computer screen. The worker, catching on almost immediately, thankfully minimized the screen and said very sternly, Hey, you can't do that, man, to the man. The man chuckled it off, then saying, 
Well, I wouldn't have to have it if she would give me a chance. Me saying nothing. I walked out. I was absolutely stunned and spooked by the audacity of this guy. I stayed away for over a week and finally returned, this time with my teenage son. Upon walking in, I didn't see him. Relieved, we checked in. The man at the front desk who was there last time welcomed me back, and he apologized for his friend's behavior. He then proceeded to tell me that the creepy man had been in several times, sometimes twice a day, looking for me and asking if I'd been back. I asked him if there was anything to be done to stop this man's advances. He told me that if he approaches me again to come to the front desk and talk to them, and that they would walk the floors and tell him to move along. I thanked him, and my son and I had our first peaceful gym visit in over a month. During the next time, I brought my son with me again, and there he was, Creepy McCreeperson. This time he followed us from equipment to equipment, staying about 10 feet away, saying nothing but glaring at us the whole time. I didn't report him because he didn't speak to me on this occasion, so I figured I'd just ignore the staring, or try to anyway, as the look on his face registered pure anger. After this point, I went to the gym less due to catching COVID. After about six weeks, I finally felt ready to go again as my strength was coming back. This time, I ventured out late at night around midnight since I was unable to sleep and I thought that maybe some cardio would help me wind down. When I got to the gym, it was very quiet. One person was working at the desk and there was only three or four other people in there. I leisurely made the rounds, trying out different equipment pieces trying to get back in the gym groove after my long hiatus and sick leave. Mid-working out with some light reps, I got that unmistakable feeling of being watched. Looking around, I finally caught the source. Standing on the other side of the gym, doing nothing but staring at me and smiling, was the creepy man. I looked right at him, and I felt my heart rate go up. The look he gave me was completely dead-eyed. This to me was far worse than the lecherous grinning looks from before. I didn't feel safe. Thankfully, the man turned away and walked out of the gym into the cold winter night. Strangely, without a coat. But I was just glad he left. Being that he was gone, I didn't want to take any chances that he was waiting outside. So I stayed longer than I had the energy for. Finally, I decided to leave. After getting my coat and winter boots on, I walked out into the dark, lonely parking lot. Thankfully, I didn't see any strange vehicles or anyone standing by my car, so I booked it over to my car to leave. Once I got to my car, however, any sense of relief was doused and replaced with chills down my spine. My rear passenger door was open, my dome light didn't work, but the parking lot light showed that there was no one in the car. But though my car was empty, there was condensation on the inside of the windows that suggested someone was waiting in the back seat of my cold car, waiting for me to come out. Apparently he had left since I stayed so long in the gym. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if I'd come out any earlier. I was always taught to check under my car in the back seat before getting into my car, especially at night. But being that this man was so frightening, I'm not certain that I would have been able to get away if I had encountered him. After that, I stopped going to that gym for the rest of the winter. Come that spring, I did return, but I still never went alone. I did report everything that happened to the gym management, and most thankfully, I've never seen that creepy man at the gym again. To get this story started, here is a bit of background information about myself. I am a female, 17 years of age. I'm very petite, weighing about 100 pounds and standing at just 5'3". I recently joined my local gym around January 2019 and have started a routine of when I work out every day, except for Monday, sometime around 6pm usually, and usually I'll stay for about an hour or two depending on the day and how I feel. 
Anyone who goes to the gym regularly notices others around them and gets familiar with what times and machines are usually available. And if a new person comes, you usually notice them. My point is, is that you get used to these people in the gym with you, whether or not you communicate with them. As a girl who goes to the gym, from my experience, you will get the occasional glance from a weirdo or make awkward eye contact with someone staring at you in the mirror. But all you can do is stare back at them dead in the eyes and give them the nastiest look of disgust. Now, the time that I go to the gym is when everyone usually starts to leave. I am very antisocial and shy, so this works out great for me. Or so I had thought, having some alone time would be excellent. And if something were to happen, they would have cameras everywhere. Now I know this is a stupid way to think, but knowing that you had to have a key card to get into the gym and one to get out was a comfort along with the cameras. For this past month of me doing my workouts, I got this weird vibe from this random guy we will call Randy. As I said, you usually get people looking at you, so it is hard to tell if someone is genuinely a significant threat or just someone being a creep. Either way, both are usually bad, but it's difficult to distinguish the two. I told my mom about this Randy guy because my gut feeling told me something was just wrong and I felt like I needed some advice. She told me we should tell the manager and have them kick him out. But being naive and friendly, I didn't want to kick a guy out just for giving me the creeps. It wasn't a good argument at the time. I started to notice some of the other girls weren't coming as regularly as they would. I brushed this off thinking they had work or were out of town or something. It was really none of my business, but it was something to note. The staff of the gym leaves around 6.30pm, and I noticed that Randy was coming in almost precisely when the manager and staff would leave. Again, I didn't really pay too much attention to this because he could have just been a regular person trying to work out at a specific time due to his job or whatever was going on in his life. This was a huge mistake on my end. Here is me trying to reason with myself and rationalize that nothing was going on because I constantly saw Randy so I considered him one of the regulars, I guess. But this is where the story actually begins. I went to do my daily workout, and the manager, let's call her Alyssa, came up and talked to me about other girls who worked out at the same time I did. These girls were complaining about Randy, secretly recording them while they worked out. The girls changed their workout schedule due to Randy, which explains why I saw fewer and fewer of them. She asked me if I had seen any men holding their phone up to their chest and walking with the camera pointed outwards. I said no, until I told Alyssa about this random man Randy, who was starting to creep me out. She said she would look into it and update me on the situation, mainly since I'm underaged. The next day, Alyssa talked to me. She said that one of the girls who complained about him pointed him out on the cameras and that she would wait for Randy to come back into the gym, kick him out, and trespass him if he ever came back. She left that night not knowing what had happened because Alyssa was still waiting after I left. I returned to the gym that following Tuesday and Alyssa told me everything that had gone down. She had said that she waited till Randy and his buddy, who we will call Kyle, came to the gym and were parked outside. Alyssa had a friend who was a sheriff. Apparently, he rang up Randy's license plates, and to both of their surprises, he was a registered sex offender and had put on probation recently. Alyssa then found out that Randy didn't even have a keycard, meaning he was not a member of the gym and shouldn't have been using the gym, period. His friend Kyle had a keycard and was letting Randy in. They would work out sometimes and wait for the staff to leave and do creepy things. Alyssa prohibited both of the men entering the gym again and kicked them out. The scary thing is, is that I remember being alone in that gym with those two guys very often. They blended in very well, and I considered them just average workout people. I'm still not sure if Randy or Kyle recorded me, but Alyssa told me she was going to look through the footage and let me know any other news she could, such as them recording me and all that. It is terrifying to think that I got accustomed to these guys regularly being at the gym. I am so thankful that Alyssa kept me informed on the situation. As terrifying as it is, it shows that you should always be aware of what's happening around you and to trust your instincts. It also shows that you never can trust anyone you think you might know. As stupid as it sounds, it's easy to get comfortable with people we see daily even if we don't know who they are. But who knows what might have happened if I caught Randy and Kyle alone again. Please be careful at all times. Never judge anyone for good or bad until you actually know them. You never know what might be out there to hurt you. Thank you for your time in reading the story.
So the story didn't happen entirely at the gym, but some of it did. I met this guy named John while I was out with some friends for a birthday party. Three of my friends and myself all decided to take another friend out for her 30th birthday. She got to choose the place, and she chose this mega bar that had formerly been a bowling alley. We were all just having drinks and dancing, having a fun time. We made a lot of 29 again jokes, and we did some shots. I was dancing enough that I never got more than a little buzzed, even though I'd had several shots of tequila. The birthday girl saw him and pointed him out, saying, That guy's been watching you all night. Go ask him to dance. I honestly hadn't noticed him, and I wasn't very interested in dancing with him. I figured she should go ask him to dance. But before I could say all this, he was at our table asking me to dance. I did dance with him. And I want you to think of how Elaine danced on Seinfeld. This guy was a tiny bit smoother than that though. We went out on a couple of dates and I liked him okay as a fellow human that is, but not as a mate. That wasn't who I saw myself with in a year, let alone 20. Why waste time with someone you know isn't the one? I won't. Well, as soon as I rejected him, he started following me around everywhere, showing up everywhere I went. At this point, I figured he'd lose interest and ignored him, pretending not to see him until he spoke. My birthday was about a month after the friend we took out. So for my birthday, one of my friends had given me a t-shirt that read, drink until he's cute, and we all joked that that's how I met John. It was a joke, especially since at that point John was being a total creeper. I wore that shirt to the gym one evening, and I was on the stair stepper when John had approached and read my shirt. He then began being his creepy self, asking inappropriate questions and trying to impose himself on my existence. He made a remark about the shirt, and I then jokingly said, Yeah, it's about you. The t-shirt's about you. Then I just laughed and laughed about it. He became sullen, muttered something, and then walked away. He didn't approach me again that night, and he probably followed me home because when I stopped at the grocery store on the way home, he was in the same store. One night, though, I'd went to the local laundromat to wash clothes, bedding, etc. My apartment complex had a laundry room, but on that night, every machine was full. I thought going to the laundromat would allow me to get my washing done early enough that I wouldn't be staying up late. While in there, I thought I saw John's car pull in. I put all my stuff in the dryer and I went next door to grab a bite. There was no one else in the laundromat, but there were people in the diner, so this was a move to have witnesses. I saw his car leave and I was really surprised that he hadn't come in to bug me while I ate. I went back to the laundromat, and guess what? My Drink Until He's Cued t-shirt, a comforter, and several pairs of my underwear had been stolen. The bastard. I collected the rest of my stuff that wasn't stolen, and I went home. I was so pissed about that t-shirt. I ended up finding another apartment with a washer and dryer inside of it, and that's where I moved, and I tried to keep it a secret. The next time I saw him, John was at my new apartment door trying to give me a letter, telling me how much he loved me and how he wanted to marry me, that we wouldn't be miserable together. He really said that. I called the police, and they showed up, but by the time they got there, he had left. They called him, and they asked if he'd been over here bothering me, and of course he said no. I was so disappointed and I realized that I would never be able to depend on them. After this incident, I ended up obtaining an order of protection, and he tried to get it nullified, but I kept the order. It made very little difference in how he behaved, though. Several weeks later, I walked to the gym. It was only about a mile away from my apartment. I lived in a very safe part of town by then, and a walk to the gym, a workout, then a walk home, sounded like the quiet night that I really needed. I'm a very friendly and outgoing person, 
but I really do need a good amount of time to myself to retain my emotional balance. I process things while alone, and it's necessary time. When I first got to the gym, John was there working out. He approached me as I arrived, and I made it clear that if he didn't just leave me alone, I would have him removed from the gym permanently. Now, I happen to be friends with the owner of the network of gyms that I worked out at back then, and I was certain I could have him removed. I didn't want to ask them to do that. However, unless he just got so bad, there was no other way. Well, not long after I began working out, he left. Or I thought he did. I walked to the water fountain, which was near the front door. There was John, parked right outside the door, leaning against his car with his arms crossed. My heart sank. I knew that he was waiting to see which car I got into, because he didn't see my car there. Once I was finished with my workout, I walked out and I tried to avoid him. The minute I'd passed, his arms were around me and he was actually trying to drag me into his car. I feigned a collapse and he wasn't ready for that, and he dropped me. I managed to keep my feet under me. I jumped up, made my way back into the gym, and I went to the manager of the gym. We'd been friends for a few years at that point. He snuck me out the back door, and he drove me home. My friend later told me that John was still actually waiting out front when he locked up the gym at 10 p.m. John found out that I'd been getting counseling, and I'd been diagnosed with PTSD. Yeah, I had a person in my sphere who was blabbing to him every chance she got. So, I received a phone call from a psychiatrist's office that provided marriage counseling. She was calling to confirm my appointment. Hello, may I speak to? Yeah, this is her. Oh, great. I'm calling to confirm your appointment on this date. Um, appointment for what? I said. Your significant other, John, has made the appointment for the two of you. She said. We provide counseling and therapy for couples. You'll be seen together, and then have that time with the doctor separately. I lost my shit. I didn't raise my voice at this woman. She was innocent. But internally, my body was jolted. I was sick to my stomach and fully enraged at the same time. I told her that if she needed to, she could record what I was about to say, or she could put me on the speakerphone so that the doctor could hear me too. I got the attorney who served as my representation in the room, and then we laid out the entire story for this doctor and his assistant. The shock in their voices told us that John had lied his sorry ass off, and the phone call ended. About one and a half to two hours later, I got a phone call from John. He just said, I heard that you canceled the appointment that we so desperately need to save our relationship. I've been in counseling too, and my counselor says that I'm a lot like OJ. This all went down some months after O.J. Simpson's famous car chase. It was an obvious ploy to try and frighten me. Of course, me being who I am, I replied, That's fine, but I'm not easy prey, John, and I think I have you outgunned. Yes, I now had sidearms, and I had trained with them. I'd gotten pretty good at just leaving that guy in the dust. Different vehicles, different places, etc., there was a rental car place that would pick you up, so I rented a car sometimes, and I would leave my car parked in front of my apartment. I could be gone all day and he'd never even realize it, but that's a lot of trouble to have to go to for privacy. He didn't miss the reference, though. You think you're tough with your little pea shooter, huh? Then he laughed. His laugh was very sinister that day. I almost replied back with, I know I'm tough with a 38 Special and a 45, jackass. I've been training extensively. But I decided that letting him think that he had the upper hand would probably be best, so I didn't say anything. I didn't want it to get to that point, but I had already decided that if I ever got pushed to it, I would end him before I let him end me. One Saturday morning, I went to the gym. I drove myself there because I was going to run errands afterwards. Just as I thought that I'd actually gotten away with going somewhere without him showing up, John was waiting outside for me when I walked out of the gym. 
He tried to hold my car door open so I couldn't drive away. I belted myself into my car so that it would be harder to drag me out, and I started the car. He was holding that door like it was his life. I backed out of the parking spot, making micro movements so I didn't bump him with the car door. He was moving with the car and holding that damn door. He was so busy pleading with me to marry him that he didn't even notice my positioning. I made very small moves so he was able to take steps with the car. My goal was to not knock him down, but to get away. Once I was in position, I ramped up the argument to frustrate him more in the hopes that he would just turn loose of the door and I could drive, but he didn't. I put my car in the lowest gear and I balanced the clutch so I could hit the throttle and then I went. I got away from him. He tried to say that I drove over his foot, but if I did, it didn't break anything. The police officer who came to visit me at the office Monday soon realized John's complaint was bullshit. My lawyer wrote another letter to John, telling him that he needed to back off and leave me alone. I appreciated the effort, but as expected, the letter didn't do anything for me except create a record of events by a third party that could be used in court if needed. I let the gym owner know what happened, and they terminated his membership without any further fanfare. He had been notified after the manager had driven me home that any further incidents would result in him losing his membership. John still tried to renew at another location, but the owners let every employee at every location know about John and his stalking. After he couldn't renew his membership, I got another message from the answering service, saying, You think you're so smart getting me removed from the gyms? Or something like that. And at one point, he managed to find my phone number. I suspected one of the young girls at the gym, but she denied. She had been his biggest apologist for months, though, and she kept telling me that all this was so romantic and how she thought he was the right one for me. I then informed her that I'm the one that decides that, and I'd already decided. He's not the one for me, damn it. Regardless, no matter how the toad got my number, he had it, and he decided to use it. He called every hour on the hour, whether I answered or not. I had enough, and I finally unplugged my phone. Then, I spent the money to change my number once again. Back then, this process took some time on the old landlines, so there were still some days that he was able to call at night. I won't drag you through every single incident that occurred with this man, but he was a very active stalker for nearly seven years. I've left food on the table at restaurants, left groceries in baskets, etc., all to get away from him. Over time, I began telling managers of my favorite places about him and building relationships. John became persona non grata in many restaurants, grocery stores, and hardware stores around town. I got orders of protection, but he always ignored them. Around that time, I met my now husband and married him. Yes, I was actually dodging John the day before our wedding and had our first child, but John didn't give up. He moved in with a married woman, which you think would slow him down, right? But no. He actually used her to stalk me so that I didn't know he was there. The saddest part was that she knew it and she let him in because she was desperate. He didn't care that I had children. He would approach me even when I was out with my kids. That man had no shame. Over time, I just became extremely careful about not only where I went, but when. I figured out the days that were safest for me to take my kids out and not be bothered by him. I did okay, and he never figured out where our new home was. He stalked and terrorized me almost daily from 1993 until 2000 when we bought our home. He couldn't find the home, and I had figured out my safe days, so for around a decade, there was very little contact. There were a couple of times though where he saw me at Walmart or Safeway with the kids, but by the time he ran to his car and rushed over to where he'd seen me walking, I had thrown the kids in the car and left. Parking around the side of the building or in front of a different store was a really great strategy. He would think that I was in the store that I was parked in front of and be milling around that store. I was gone before he realized, and before anyone criticizes my husband for not standing up for me, 
He did. He and John worked at the same hospital for a time, and one day my husband stepped into an elevator that John and only John was in. My husband crossed his arms and gave John a look that could melt steel, and he backed old John into a corner. John was so afraid that he actually peed himself, and he got off the elevator at the next floor. Well, a day later, John had left a message on my office answering service that said, I hope you know your boy doesn't scare me. Then he was very careful to not ever encounter my husband, as well as being very careful to not encounter me when I was with my husband. Such bravery. That was just one instance, but there were many more. But John did truly avoid my husband. If he showed up where my car was and saw that it was the both of us, he laughed. Around 2010, John took ill with some mysterious disease, and he died a very slow, two-year painful death from what I heard. I know this sounds really petty, but I'm glad he died a painful death. That bastard deserved it for what he put me through. That was all 10 years ago, and I finally stopped looking over my shoulder the day I heard that. I actually relaxed for the first time in many years. I hadn't realized just how tense and hyper aware I'd become until I no longer needed to be that way. In the years since this all began, my state has increased the stocking laws, and John wouldn't be able to get away with nearly as much today as he did back then. I can only offer platitudes and cautions like others do, but I won't. My only hope is that you'll remember some of the things I did, and if you ever encounter someone like that, use them. These stories are from the survivors and are offered to give you ideas of things you can do to ensure your own survival. But I really hope you never have to go through what I did. This isn't your typical scary story, but it was a pretty weird situation, and it definitely was creepy. So I was going to my friends, and I was going to be late so I requested an Uber. The first guy canceled on me, but the second one accepted it. He was about two minutes away. In the app, it told me that the driver arrived, but I didn't see the car anywhere around me at all. However, there was this one car that came in par next to me, but it didn't have the same plate number of my Uber driver, nor did the driver look like the guy in the app. I decided to call the driver, but he didn't pick up. Weird. So I look back to the guy parked next to me, making sure once again that it's not the car I'm supposed to be riding in. I begin to see him looking at me from the rear view mirror. We maintained eye contact the whole time, and I started to get a really weird bad gut feeling. I was getting uncomfortable, so I decided to walk to another area to wait for my actual Uber driver to arrive. The guy in the parked car then started to slowly drive his car to where I moved to, once again parking right next to me. We once again had a stare down with one another. I again started to walk away from him, but just like before, he started to follow me with his car. I couldn't catch a damn break with this guy. I was getting so sick of all of this, so I pulled out my phone and I decided to call my Uber driver to see where the hell he was. He finally pulled up, and as soon as I saw his car, I got inside as fast as I could. I then looked to see where the other car was, and I then saw it speeding in the opposite direction. I eventually and finally arrived at my friend's house, but I didn't really feel like mentioning everything that happened. I did, however, spend the rest of that night mostly going through everything that happened in my head. Was that other driver truly a creep out to get me? Or was I just being overly paranoid? I'd really like to think that since every time I moved to a different spot and then following me, it wasn't just my paranoia, but I really don't know. It's really wild to think about though, because if something bad had actually happened to me, I never would have made it to my friends that night, and no one would have ever known. That thought really terrifies me. I guess I should be grateful though that nothing like that happened. Uber is a wonderful tool for transportation, but just like with everything else, it has its own dangers as well. Be safe out there everyone, and if you take an Uber, 
Be absolutely sure you're getting into the right vehicle. I'm a 26-year-old female who lives in the north of the UK. This happened during the early hours of this morning. I was out from 1 o'clock in the afternoon for my friend's birthday, and we had gone out for a meal and a few drinks afterwards. We were out all day up until midnight. I didn't drink as much as they did, as it makes me feel really sick after a few. So I was feeling okay, but just a little tipsy more than anything else, as I was mainly drinking non-alcoholic drinks. When it was time to go home, I had ordered an Uber separate from my friends, as they were going in a completely different direction to me. I had just picked up some food, and I was waiting for my Uber outside a local subway. It took a while for it to get to me, and I was waiting for about 15 minutes, as it was a Saturday night and it was busy. The Uber driver called me, asking where I was. He seemed okay on the phone, and I assumed he had gotten lost, so I then told him where I was. Like I said, he seemed okay on the phone when he rang, and he did eventually find me. As I got inside, he had asked where I was going, and I then told him and we set off. While I was in the car, he had asked me a few questions about how my night was, like if I had a good time and just the general questions you would normally ask. After a while, it was silent, but it was okay, as I didn't really mind the silence. My ears were really ringing a lot due to the music in the club. I remember putting my phone in my bag, but the back of the car was very dark, so it was kind of hard to see anything. I eventually got to my destination, and he had parked a little bit down the road from my house because I didn't want him to see where I actually live. I wished him a good night and got out of the car, then started walking towards my house. About 10 seconds after getting out of the car and walking, I then realized that my phone wasn't in my bag. I turned around to see if he was still parked, but he had driven off already. That's when I realized that I must have accidentally left my phone in the car. I usually check the back seat whenever I leave an Uber or a Lyft, just in case I ever accidentally leave something. However, as it was very dark with barely any light, I did check but I didn't see anything. And I remember putting my phone in my bag, so I just assumed that it was in my bag when I left the car. I did start to panic, as I had really important things on my phone like banking information, personal things, etc. And I didn't have another phone or anything. I rationalized it in my head, and when I got home, I decided to borrow my boyfriend's phone to call mine and see if he could bring it back. I thought as he had just left, he might still be in the area, so I hurried home quietly, borrowing my boyfriend's phone while he was asleep, trying not to wake him up, as I just really wanted to get this resolved as fast as possible. When I called, he answered, and before I could say anything, he rudely said, I'm with another customer. I'll call you back. Now, I do understand that he couldn't talk if he's driving with another customer. However, there was no reason to be rude about it. Anyways, I sat there for about five minutes waiting and getting more anxious as time went on, and I decided to call him again, but he declined the call. I assumed he was still with the customer, so I just began waiting, and shortly after, he had called me back within a few seconds after. So this is where the whole thing began to get kind of scary for me. I've never been in a situation before like this, and I can be really naive to things. When I answered, I then said, Hi, I left my phone in your car. Could you please bring it back if you're in the area? Or can you please put it somewhere safe so I can pick it up? I had expected the man to agree or give me options on what to do. But the only thing the driver said was, I'm very busy. I don't have time to drop your phone off. You're going to have to pay me 10 pounds to drop it off. Now, I don't even know if that's actually a thing. But all I could think about was my phone. So I agreed to pay him if he actually brought my phone. He then followed that with, Wait outside your house. I'll be about five minutes. And I then gave him my address again so he knew where to go. I stood outside, 
and I had thrown on my dressing gown and slippers, as I thought it would park outside my house and it would be a fast exchange. I don't carry cash on me, so I wasn't really sure how I was supposed to pay him. I figured we would do it via the Uber app or something similar. When he pulled up, he had parked on the opposite side of the road. Now, where I live, my house is on a main road with a few fields around, and there's plenty of houses, so I thought it would be safe. However, it was really late, and nobody was around. The driver showed up, and he had rolled down his window, then shouting my name to come over. At this point, I was getting really nervous about the whole situation, but I then went over, and then he said, Yeah, so give me the money, and then I'll give you your phone. He had tried to be intimidating, and it had really worked, because I was getting very nervous. I then told him as nicely as possible, I haven't got cash on me, I'm gonna have to do it online through banking or transfer. When I said this, he gave me a really creepy smile, then saying, Okay, get in the car then. And I was really confused on why he wanted me to get into the car. I tried telling him no, it's okay, we can do it like this, but he was being very persistent about it, and he was really pressuring me, then saying, If you want your phone, come around and get in. At this point, all of the alarm bells are ringing in my head, telling me to go wake up my boyfriend and help me, because this isn't normal. I'm an independent person, and I didn't listen to the voice in my head, as I really wanted to solve this by myself and just get it done and over with. So I went and got in the car, but I left the door open, and I had one leg out of it just in case he tried anything so I couldn't make a run for it. He told me to then close the door, but I refused. While in the car, I had tried telling him that I need to do a bank transfer, so I really need my phone to do it. He was struggling to understand what I was trying to tell him, that or he didn't want to give me my phone back. I think that because I was being very polite to him, besides all of the red flags going off, and the only way that he thought he was getting the money from me was to give me my phone, so he did so, and I then put in his car details to transfer him the money. I was shaking the entire time, and just then, as I was trying to put in my details, it locked me out. As I then realized I was typing in the wrong number for my card, and it blocked me from sending it. There were a million things running through my head at that moment. I didn't know how he was going to react, and I didn't know if he would refuse to let me go, but I knew I had to get out, as I could see that he was starting to get angry. I needed to be quick, so I told him I needed to grab another card from inside my house, but before he could answer me or stop me, I got out of the car as quickly as possible, running over to my house, running inside, and locking the door behind me. As I was leaving the car, I could feel his hand try and grab my arm, but it wasn't quick enough as I was already out of the car. I started tearing up after I got in my house, and I started panicking. The man then started ringing my boyfriend's phone, which I had been using to call him, but I blocked the number. He eventually drove off after about 10 minutes. I really hadn't realized just how serious the situation was until I got back inside. I kept checking the window, thinking it would come back. I immediately reported him via the Uber app, and I couldn't fall asleep until about 3 in the morning. I told my boyfriend the next morning, and he was totally furious at the situation and how I got taken advantage of. I didn't really know if it was normal for your Uber driver to ask for money to bring an item back. I eventually got in contact with Uber's head office this morning, still shaken up with the whole situation, and they've been really helpful so far and apologizing. They will hopefully help me and make sure that this driver doesn't do this to any other girls. I'm 99% sure that he wouldn't have made me get into his car if my boyfriend had been with me. He didn't try to do anything to me. But I do wonder what would have happened if I had closed the door like he asked, and then realized he wasn't getting his money. I know that this could have completely gone a different direction, and I'm really lucky that I got out of it. I know it was really naive and stupid of me to not wake up my boyfriend when it all started to get really serious. But in my head, I thought, how am I going to wake him up when I have his phone and we're outside? 
I was so thankful that my boyfriend was inside and that I lived on a main road. So if anything had happened, I could have yelled and shouted and hopefully somebody nearby might have heard or seen it. I'm absolutely on edge right now as he knows where I live and if he ends up losing his job, he might come back for me. That really can happen and I'm trying to process it. I know this might not seem that very scary, but at the time, I was terrified. Please be careful when traveling alone late at night, and if you have a partner or housemate, make sure to wake them up if you need help, no matter how late it is. I've always listened to your stories, but I've never really had a story of my own to post, but now I do. I'm going to give you some background information here, so here goes. I've lived in Utah for most of my life, other than a few years in Wyoming. I'm an Uber driver in Utah, and I have been for a few years now. What I'm about to tell you took place about one year ago, right around the time when I was specifically an Uber Eats driver. I had just gotten finished with the shift of delivering food, and I was on the phone with my mother when I got the broad idea to go looking for a former apartment that we had lived in when I was younger. Now, normally I carry my 9mm on me, but that was at home, so I decided I would go home to pick it up, just in case I got into a bad situation and I needed it for protection. My mother had done some research on the address of the apartment. The apartment used to be called Midtown Villa, and it was really never full of any kind of gang activity when I was younger. So I had typed the address in my Google Maps and drove over there. I pulled in and I realized that the apartment is now called the Calaveras and that everything was now a lot better looking than it used to be. So I let my guard down, which looking back now, I really regret. I started pulling through the apartments with my mom on the phone, which we had then agreed that I can put her on video chat so she too can see the new upgrades. I had pulled back through the entrance off the main road, and I had started showing my mother the building that used to be our apartment building, and I was pointing at the building and empty lot next to it. Now, the empty lot used to be a playground when I was a kid. Here's my first mistake. I was using a phone to show my mother, which made it look like I was recording. Second mistake, I was pointing. And third mistake, I was in a bad area and I let my guard down. Now, the reason why I tell you those mistakes is because what I didn't realize is while I was showing my mother, I was passing a guy and a girl and pointing. Now I know, all that alone doesn't seem bad, but apparently, I must have really pissed someone off who must have thought I was recording them. Even though I had my 9mm with my loaded magazine, I had made some odd choices due to the fact that I'm a very direct person. As I continue forward, I realize that that same guy is now chasing me on foot and he's coming right for me. He's yelling at me, calling out and asking if I wanted to tussle, all while towards me and taking photos of my car. Now, before realizing it, I was suddenly moving forward faster in my car. My mind was made up. I was getting the hell out of there and driving off. Now, the events that are about to take place are due to the fact that I have some extensive training outside of others' knowledge, even though I had let most of that slip. My adrenaline was pumping, and instead of harnessing it, I mistakenly let it control my actions. With my mom still on video chat, I suddenly took notice of a car pulling up fast behind me. I took off out of there, and then the car was behind me. I turned right, and they turned right. Same turn I made again, they followed. So I went up to 9,000 South, then taking a ride after stopping, thinking I was being paranoid. Nope. They then followed me all the way to 1300 West. That's where I turned right again. Guess who followed? No, I'm not gonna lie. I was very nervous with multiple scenarios playing in my head, because I knew I was in a bad situation. I knew that if it came down to it, I had my pistol. I know what you're all thinking. Dial 911, you idiot. Well, I'm the type of person that really rarely ever does that, and I wanted to get out of this on my own. 
While these scenarios crossed my mind, I suddenly got the bright idea to turn right onto 7800 South. So I did, as did they. But this time, a semi had gotten between us, right behind me. I was honestly very happy until the semi had turned left. Then I knew I had to figure out what to do next. My next decision was to turn left. I approached the next light in the left turn lane to get onto the road that leads to 7200 South where the I-15 ramp was on. What I didn't think about though was what would happen if they followed me. Now what happens next is going to really make you reconsider for not asking for help when you really need it if you're anything like me. I turned left and they followed, speeding up on my right in that lane. So I immediately swerved over after turning on my signal, and I then got in front of them, because let's face it, if they happen to get next to me, it could be game over. So I slowed down a little, then they got in the left lane and they sped up to me. I then sped up as well, and just as we hit 90 miles per hour, I then slammed on my brakes, and they slammed on theirs and turned right. If I had been there, I could have been hit and rolled my car, and even died, and at the very least I would be in the hospital. That's when they then took off down the road on their right, and I booked it to the interstate. I drove to the grocery store near my house, calling the police department near that apartment complex in order to report it. The dispatcher then informed me that I should have called 911 to make the situation easier, and they would have directed me to the nearest police station with officers outside to deal with anything that followed me into the parking lot. The officer then called me, and we talked about it. He had went on to tell me that that area was very problematic with gang activity, and he believes that my extreme concern and judgment were very accurate. I then headed home, and I didn't let my guard down until I got home. I told my fiancé all about it the very next day, and she told me to never deliver to that area without some form of protection. So in closing, number one, don't ever leave yourself without protection. Number two, always ask for help when you need it, because otherwise, your life could really be at stake. Number three, don't be naive to your situation. I really hope that this doesn't happen to anyone else. And remember, it's not the people with pistols in their holsters that you have to watch out for. It's the people that tuck them into their waistbands without a holster. Those are the ones you have to watch out for. Be safe, everyone. And thanks for listening. I'm a 20-year-old female. I live in an area that not everyone would consider safe, but I've gotten used to it since I've grown up in it, and I never really heard much happening where my house was located in. On this day, I was feeling very sick. No, it wasn't COVID, but my nose and throat were very dry. It almost felt like I swallowed a bunch of sandpaper. Anyways, my parents were busy and out of the house, and I realized that we didn't have any cough drops, which I needed, and I decided to walk to the Walgreens near my house. It was about a 10-minute walk. I went to the store on my own, and to make matters worse, it was a hot summer. I usually wear both of my headphones so that I can avoid talking to people or random guys talking to me, and there were plenty of those. Keep in mind, I'm a six foot tall woman, and I did Marine RO, so I can easily say that I would always win a fight or that I look intimidating. Anyways, I was coming back home and I'd passed a couple who were going the opposite direction I was. I had a clear look at them because the man was wearing a whole cub shirt, and the woman had a very red shirt. I saw that they were staring, and I could feel them staring at me while I was walking away, but I didn't pay too much attention to it since I've never really been in a situation like that. Well, when I was going to cross a street, I then stopped myself because there's two ways to get back to my house. I either pass a park, which for some reason that day was pretty much complete with people, or I go through an alley, and I know it must sound cliche, but the alley was the way faster way home. So I made the stupid decision to go through the alley. 
I had a very bad gut feeling halfway through that someone was following me. And lo and behold, it was the guy with the cub shirt. At first, I didn't really mind because I realized this guy was a lot shorter than me at like five foot six or five foot seven. But as I was walking, I saw that in the other end of the alley, which was where I was supposed to walk towards, there was a brown van, which I could then see a person sitting in the driver's seat with a bright red shirt on. I automatically turned around to then see the guy, and I saw that he was getting closer to me. So as fast as the situation was going, I then reacted, and I turned towards the guy and ran towards him. And as soon as he saw me running towards him, he then tried to reach for something. But before he did so, I then punched him on the side of his head with the side of my right arm, which was actually enough to make him fall, and I then ran as fast as I could out of the alley to the park, which happened to be on the other side of the alley. But at the same time I was running out of there, I had heard screeching tires of that van from behind me. I was able to cross over to run over to the next side where the park was located, and I then stopped right there due to me being unable to breathe properly. Because like I said before, I was sick, my nose was stuffed, and it was hot. Luckily, there was a lady that saw I looked pretty panicked, and she then asked me if I was okay. I went on to explain to her that these two people just tried to kidnap me, and I asked her if I could just stay with her for a while. She agreed. I texted my sisters that were still home that I was going to take a little bit longer because of the line in the store, because I just didn't want them to panic or anything. Still, meanwhile I was doing that, I saw the same damn guy on the other side of the street which the park was facing, and I then told a lady that that was the guy. As soon as she saw him standing there trying to hide behind a parked car, she started screaming at him, then saying, Get the fuck away before she calls the cops. And as soon as she started yelling at him, others caught on to what was happening, and the guy then decided to begin walking away little by little thinking people wouldn't see him. And what do you know? Then that damn brown van comes along and picks him up. As soon as I felt like it was okay for me to go, I said thank you to the lady, and she asked if I wanted her to walk me home. But I said it was okay since I didn't live that far away and I could jog it. As soon as I got home, I explained the situation to my 18-year-old sister, as I thought she would understand the situation better than my younger one. We decided to not call the cops because we didn't have any evidence, and as you can imagine, the police most likely wouldn't do much, because again, I don't live in a very safe area. I didn't tell my parents due to not wanting them to get worried and be scared about this, but I'm very grateful for that woman, and I really owe her a huge thank you. Be safe out there, because no matter how big or tall you might be when you're in those situations, Fear still has its way of creeping up on you. I'm 37 years old, and this happened when I was 7. It won't seem that scary to some people, but to a 7-year-old child, it was terrifying. I was sitting out on my front porch swing looking at the cars going by. For a little context, the front of my house faces a busy road, and we have a huge front yard with a bunch of flowers, and we always got compliments on how gorgeous our yard was. Anyway, as I was relaxing, I noticed a beat up old car slowing down as they drove past my house, and I just thought that maybe he was looking at the yard, so I was calm. Then, I noticed the guy turn around and started coming down the other side of the street, and he then made a U-turn to drive by my house yet again. I was getting kind of freaked out at this point. After he drove by, he pulled down a side road then went up into the housing development, and my house was the last one on the street. I sat and watched as he drove down the lane and then stopped, giving me a big and sinister smile, then saying, Hi little girl, how's it going? I freaked the hell out and I ran inside to tell my mom and dad. My dad got mad and he grabbed his gun then going outside, and when I pointed the guy out, he then screeched his tires and drove away. It scared the hell out of me because I was only a little girl. After that experience, I'm always very aware of other people, and if I ever get a bad vibe from someone, 
I know to get away from them ASAP. As always, please everyone, be careful out there. It really is a crazy world. Just to begin, I'm a 21 year old female. At the time of this story, I had been in elementary school and I'm not exactly sure how old I was. My uncle owns a cabin in the mountains and when I was a child, my family would always get together at this cabin to spend some time together at least twice a year. I consider this cabin to be a second home for me. I always felt so safe and comfortable there. So when this day happened, it totally ruined it for me. A few streets down from our cabin, there's a clubhouse with a pool, a hot tub, and an area to play pool and ping pong. On this particular day, my cousin KH, my sister KS and I decided to walk down to the clubhouse to go for a swim. The walk there was a breeze and we had a really great time at the pool. After we were done, we began our walk home. Something to note is that from a very early age, I've always been a very fast walker. People who walk very slow have always driven me crazy. After a few minutes of walking, I remember getting very frustrated by how slow my sister and cousin were walking. They were walking very slow and also excluding me out of their conversation anyways, so I decided to walk ahead of them. After walking only a few minutes, I had completely lost them. There was no sign of them behind me. As I was walking down the dirt road, I saw this white jeep driving towards me. As soon as they had seen me, they quickly turned around and then started following me down the road. I saw them rolling their window down and then following quickly behind me. My fight or flight instinct kicked in immediately and I then took off down the road. They continued following me, but thankfully I was just a few minutes away from our cabin, so I did manage to make it home safely. Once they saw that I was home, they then took off in the other direction. I then ran inside the cabin completely out of breath and yelled for my uncle. I told him everything that happened and he decided to get in the car to go look for this white jeep. Of course, they were nowhere to be seen. This definitely could have been a whole lot worse if I wasn't aware of stranger danger, but I ran the fastest that I've ever ran in my entire life. The moral of this story is to never walk alone, especially as a child. Even as an adult, I never walk anywhere alone because of this. My paranoia is off the charts. It's really wild how one day can change the way you look at the world. Don't ever think it can't happen to you. Be safe. Back in May 2020, I was in Portland, Oregon. I went there for college and I graduated the year before but I was still living in Portland State Campus in non-student housing. I had a friend who did, however. She lived up on a one-way hill at an apartment complex called the Amy. The walk from her apartment to mine is about three to four minutes, and I've never felt uncomfortable, no matter the time of day going home. We hung out one night, and I left later than I normally did. It was around 5 a.m., since it was still dark and very early in the morning, I told my friend I would update her when I got to certain areas of the walk. While I normally listen to music or YouTube on my walk home, I decided to enjoy the quiet downtown. As soon as I get outside the main doors, I then hear a car start to the left of me in the parking lot that was backed into the spot. But as I started walking, a newer and nice wide hatchback drove past me slowly. The man had Apple Maps up, so I thought he was just lost, but I still kept my eye on the car as it then went down the hill. Now there's another complex at the bottom of the hill, and the car turned right into that parking lot, just not all the way. They did a three-point turn to where their headlights were now facing right at me. At this point, I was at the bottom of the hill, and I stood facing towards him, looking directly at him to let him know I see him. He slowly drove past me, looking directly at me, and then took another three-point turn to where he was now backed up on the wrong way and a one-way. It was like we were playing chess, and now it was my move. 
I could either run across the bridge towards the campus or back up the hill. I called my friend and she answered quickly. I didn't even let her speak. I just told her, Why car? Why car? 094. As those were the first three license plate numbers and I then ran up the hill so fast. I heard the sound of tires burning on the road, but I didn't look back after I made it to the main doors of my friend's complex. When I did, the car was speeding on the freeway entrance closest to the bridge. As it turns out, this isn't the first time the man tried this. Before I met my friend, she would have to leave for work around this time, and it happened to her twice. The first time, she had noticed the car following her to the bus stop, but there was someone else out, so she thought nothing of it. Then, in November 2019, for a second time, she noticed the same white car following her down the hill, but she was alone this time. She turned around to get home, but walked to not let the man know she was on to him. As she was walking, she heard the car driving slowly behind her, and then a car door open. She then ran at that point. This means two things. One, the man wasn't alone in the car. The back windows were tinted, so someone was hiding. And two, this is one of probably many spots that they stake out for young women that are walking alone. I made a report to the cops and I contacted the apartment complex to make their college residences aware of this man. Nothing came from either of those, sadly, and I felt so hopeless. I didn't leave out any details I can remember to help others still in that area and to also remind everyone that awareness is key. Before this experience, I walked around Portland without a care in the world or any self-defense. My paranoia was always on when I was outside my home, and while I like to think it turned into a healthy awareness, I'm always armed with a knife. My heart still drops whenever I think I'm being followed, or whenever I'm alone and there's a man, car or not. Listen to your intuition, and stay safe my friends. This happened back in 2008, and at the time, I was 8 years old. My mom and I had gone shopping to a Big Lots, located at a plaza not too far away from our house. This plaza was notorious for crime. There were lots of panhandlers, drug addicts, and people getting mugged. You get the picture. Behind the Big Lots was a large park, and the other side of that was a wooded area and to the right was a high school. This will be important later. So anyways, we're doing our shopping and I needed to use the restroom. My mom and I went to the restroom which was located at the far back corner of the store, away from everything else. Also, it's important to note that the restroom's view from the rest of the store is blocked by an aisle shelf. Another important detail is there's an emergency exit door right next to the men's restroom that leads out the back of the store to the park. This will also be important. Anyways, I go into the restroom and I sit on the toilet to do my thing, and I lock the stall door. My mom was standing right outside the restroom waiting. Well, not even 15 seconds after I get in the stall, I then hear footsteps hurriedly running up to the stall door and then somebody starts throwing their whole body against the door. They do this twice, and I then said that I was in there. Another quick detail to note is that this restroom has two stalls, and the other one was empty. So if this guy needed the stall that bad, he could have just used the other one. Anyways, after I said that, the guy again began throwing his whole body against the door repeatedly so hard that the lock almost popped out of place and the whole stall door was bowing inwards. I started screaming and I then heard my mom come in and ask the man what the fuck he's doing. Now, here's what my mom told me since I didn't see it happen. Apparently he stopped, turned around, and then shoulder charged her knocking her against the wall, then running out of the bathroom. I finished quickly, exit the stall, and I did see my mom holding the back of her head as she then stands up. Her head was bleeding, and there was actually a blood stain on the wall. He had pushed her down so hard that he hit her up against the wall and actually cracked her head open. 
Now, this was back in 2008, and at the time, we didn't have any cell phones. So, we then exited the bathroom, abandoning our shopping cart, and went to the front cash registers. My mom then explains what happened to one of the cashiers, and they called 911. The police arrive, and so does an ambulance to take my mom to the hospital. As she's being put in the ambulance, the police take a statement, and I then use the phone at the cash register to call my dad to come pick me up. While I'm waiting, the police take my mom's description of the guy and begin searching the outside area. They reviewed the camera footage in the store, but unfortunately, the crappy cameras were from the 80s, and they were so pixelated you could hardly make anything out. The police couldn't really do much, since they didn't have too much to go off of, other than one of the cashiers who told the police which way she seen the man go after she saw him leave the store. Fast forward about a week, and my mom's back home now after recovering. Well, one morning we were watching the news, and we see a story about a man who has apparently been arrested for attempted kidnapping at the Kroger in the same plaza. Apparently the guy had snatched a two-year-old girl out of a shopping cart while her dad wasn't looking and tried to run out of the store with her. Luckily the dad tackled the guy to the ground before he could get away, and a bystander caught the girl as she fell from his arms. The guy had a knife on him, and he managed to stab the dad once before the dad managed to disarm him. The police arrived and arrested the man, and he was going to be charged with attempted kidnapping, attempted murder, and also assault with a deadly weapon. When the news channel then showed the man's picture, and both to my mom and I's horror, it was the same man that shoved her to the wall in the big lots. When the man was in the bathroom before, I hadn't actually gotten a good look at him myself, but from the picture, he looked to be in his 50s, had gray hair, a gray beard with wrinkles all over his face, and cold, lifeless black eyes that seemed to stare right through the TV screen and into your soul. My mom immediately called the police non-emergency line and then explained everything to them. They took her statement and they told her she would have to testify in court. The man received two counts of attempted kidnapping, as well as assault with a deadly weapon, and also assault and battery. The man was sentenced to prison, and my mom also learned that the man was homeless in his late 50s, and he was living in a van in that plaza parking lot. I can't help but think what would have happened if that stall door lock had given out. I might not be here writing this today. I honestly believe the man's plan was to take me and run out of the emergency exit that was right next to the restroom, and he likely had his van parked right outside that door. I guarantee then he had been watching us in the store, and had most likely planned this whole thing out. It's been over 10 years now, and I've only been back to that Big Lots a few times since then. The Big Lots has security guards in the store now, and they finally got new cameras installed as well. And the Kroger also has security guards, and they also have police regularly patrolling the plaza now. To that creepy and deranged guy that had almost kidnapped me and that little girl. Rot in hell. When I was in college, I moved into my first apartment after about two years of living on campus. I've always been very aware of my surroundings, and I'm a very tall female so I don't normally run into situations that make me concerned about my safety. The apartment was a one-bedroom apartment on the top floor of a three-story building. The stairs of the apartments were exterior near the center of the building, and there were four units on each floor. From the peephole of the front door, I could see all the other unit doors, something that was helpful for me to see what was going on. When I first moved in, my friend was on the first floor in another one-bedroom unit, and we were very comfortable with the complex. My friend had moved out when the story happened, and I only had one semester left. Most of my neighbors I hardly ever saw because of my class schedule. My major was extremely demanding, so I would spend several late nights in class or working on projects. On this particular day, my class had been canceled, so I was able to walk home in the middle of the day. It was sunny, and I remember being really excited about it getting warmer. 
I was walking up the stairs from the street to the mailboxes, and I checked to see if I'd gotten anything. The mailboxes were right next to the stairs. I was looking through the letters when I heard someone walking up from the parking lot, so I looked up and I saw a young guy. I'm a pretty quiet person, so I just looked up and then went right back to what I was doing while still keeping some awareness of what he was doing. He looked up from his phone as I looked away, and he started to look me up and down. I turned the key to lock my mailbox, and he then smiled seeing this. Hey, do you live here? He asked. Yeah, I do, I said, and I started walking up the stairs. He started following me. Really? Because I've never seen you around here before. I kind of just shrugged after that. Yeah, I guess my schedule is weird or something. I can't really remember the order of what he said next, but he asked if I was doing anything later. Odd question, I thought, but I just said, yeah, I have plans with my friends and a few. He looked really disappointed, and he then quickly said, You know, I'm going to be moving next week, and I have some furniture I'm selling. You should come over and take a look. I'd give you a really good deal. I laughed nervously at that, and just tried to say that I had plenty of stuff, but that I did appreciate the offer. He continued to press. Oh, come on. You can look at it right now. I think I'd let you have some stuff for free if you want. I just replied back with, Like I said, I have plans right now, so I don't have time. Okay, then, well, why don't you give me your number, and then you can text me when you're ready. I kept walking and I told him I wasn't comfortable with that. He then squinted his eyes, then saying, What, do you have a boyfriend or something? Yeah, actually I do. I replied back. He tried to look innocently at me as he continued to skin my body with his eyes. Well, how about you knock on the door when you have time? We had gotten to the top of the stairs at this point, so I just said sure quickly then went into my apartment, locking the door behind me. I looked through the peephole, and he was literally just standing there staring at my door. I was pretty annoyed for most of that conversation, but this, it made me feel really uneasy. I then watched him unlock his door directly across from me, and then grab a chair to sit in his hallway and watch my door. I knew I had half an hour before I needed to go meet my friends, but I wasn't going to leave with him sitting there like that. I don't know what possessed him to be so obvious. I guess I at least knew where he was. I called my boyfriend at the time and I asked if he'd come over and walk me to my car after explaining the experience. He was furious and he came over immediately. And when the guy heard him coming up the stairs, he closed his door. And from the weird feelings I got, I honestly believe he watched us through his peephole. Luckily, I was able to avoid seeing him until he moved out, but there were a couple of times I came home and his door was wide open with a bed set up in the hallway. I always had my key ready and moved fast to not let anyone catch me outside my door. This may not be the scariest story to some people, but that bed set up in the hall always set off alarms every time. I'm a girl in my late teens who started dating my now boyfriend in mid-2021, and the story takes place in early 2022. To give you some background information, my boyfriend who I'll call B used to be affiliated with the wrong group of people, who did certain things that you aren't illegally allowed to do. During those times, he would get into numerous fights and altercations with different people, and had a lot of bad blood going around with B. B came to the realization that they didn't want to be affiliated with these people anymore, so they slowly made their way out of this group of people. When we first got together, B had told me some stories that happened to them, and all of the different threats they got when they left. I didn't think too much of it, as it's all in the past, and it won't affect us. But I was wrong. It was like I said, early 2022 and me and B were making a quick trip up the street to the store. 
Now, where they live is right on a main street in a not so well protected or safe area. These houses on the right side next to a lot with a few different little shops. B keeps a car cover on their car every night and at this time, we decided to go to the store. As we walked out of their house, I had immediately noticed a black truck in the lot next to their house. It was around 9 p.m., and all of the stores in that lot closed at 6, so it wasn't any worker or anything of the sort. It was also pitch black outside, as we were still in the winter. I take my mind off the truck, and I mention it to B, and I ask, Hey, have you seen that truck before? They took a quick glance of the truck and said, No, I've never seen it before. We continue on taking the cover off the car, and I keep my eyes on this truck because it was really giving me this weird feeling. We get into the car and they start it up, and as we're just sitting there waiting for the car to warm up, B looks up at the truck and one of the lights are on inside giving us a shadowy kind of look of maybe one or two people. It wasn't very clear, but B then said to me, Look. And I looked up at the truck, and the light turned off. As we're pulling out of the driveway to get into the main road, the truck started up, and then immediately pulled out of the lot and got behind us. They had their brights on, and was also tailgating us the whole way to the store. The store's only about a two minute drive, and as we're pulling into the lot of the store, the truck then makes a U-turn and then parks on the side of the road right outside of the parking lot. I wasn't really planning on going into the store with B, as he was getting only one thing, so I just stayed in the car as B got out. He told me to keep the doors locked and just wait for him. I was already internally freaking out about this truck. Knowing he was only 30 to 40 feet away from our car scared me even more. And from my perspective, they knew who we were and were trying to do something. As B leaves and locks the car, I'm sitting on my phone when in the passenger mirror, I then see someone walking up to the car. He was crouched walking right along the car and I think he saw me looking at him through the mirror and he then rushed to my door trying to open it. He banged on the door over and over, and he started to hit the window with what sounded like all of his force. It was absolutely terrifying, and I didn't know what to do. I grabbed a pocket knife that we had in the center console of the car, and I held it up, yelling for him to get the fuck away. I screamed at the top of my lungs for this man to get away from the car, but he's still trying to punch the window through. I was making a really loud commotion, when then B and two other men opened the store door, and as we were parked almost right in front of it, the man noticed them and started running back to the already turned on truck. They then hopped in the passenger seat and sped off. I was scared, absolutely terrified, any other word you can think of. The man in the process of trying to get into the car actually broke the handle of the car, and they also made dents into the passenger side door. We called the police and I gave the best description of the guy I could, as well as the truck, while B also gave his. That was pretty much the end of the night. A few days later, B gets numerous messages from multiple different sources, sending them threats, with one then saying, That's not even the worst of it. I'm not 100% sure if that was related to it, but my gut and everyone who knows about this situation tells me it is. A week after that, me and B took a trip to our family's house in another state, just wanting to get away from there for a month. Since then, we haven't had any more interactions or problems since being home, and I really hope to keep it that way. I don't know if this is associated with his past behavior and the past people he was involved with, but if it is, I really hope that's the end of it. This happened on February 1st. I'm a female, and I live in Washington State. My online boyfriend came over to visit me during this time, and we were sleeping together. My mom came rushing into my room, then saying, I think I heard someone walking outside, and they were trying to unlock the door. They were messing with the door. My mom starts to panic, and my boyfriend immediately sits up. 
I get up and I go to the living room quickly, already seeing my dad only in his boxers and slippers, holding his gun. He tells me and my boyfriend to protect my mom and siblings as he goes outside, seeing that the doorknob was all scratched up and seemed like it was smashed in. While I was holding my brothers close, my mom was just breaking down, and I then told them that we should move to my room, which is the room in the middle. We moved to the room as I called the cops while my boyfriend was comforting my siblings and mom. My younger brother's room is the first room, mine in the middle, and the last room is my mom's, but it was being renovated at the time, so she had to sleep on a mattress in the living room while she waited for the room to be renovated. Usually my dad doesn't sleep with my mom, and he sleeps in the motorhome instead that's parked next to our trailer. It's basically like his office house and where he works, but for this night, he chose to sleep with my mom, which I'm really glad he did. Anyways, I then heard a loud bang as I looked out the window, and I saw my dad running down our backyard. The walkway of our backyard is sort of like a hill. There's the garage on the left, and when you walk farther, it's our patio on the right, and then if you keep going straight, it's a longer hill but forest. Well, after waiting for about 10 minutes, the cops came and so did the ambulance. I went to the porch, and I then saw a man being carried with a stretcher. It was some random man that I had never seen before. I saw that he was bleeding and looking straight at me with a sinister smile, as if wherever my dad shot him didn't affect him. Which, by the way, yeah, my dad shot him. I just watched as they took him to the back of the ambulance and then left after. The very next morning, my dad told us that when he was chasing the man, he ended up shooting him in the leg and he fell down the hill that led to the forest. He kept the man there until the cops came. Later that day, we got a call from the cops as I was in the kitchen table doing my online college work. After that phone call, he told me what they said. Apparently the man that had tried to break in had a knife, lockpick, duct tape, rope and a camera all in his bag that he carried. He was a wanted man in some other state, I think it was Idaho or Indiana, and he apparently wanted to kidnap me because he only went after young women. So it was very possible that he was stalking me without me even realizing it. I was totally freaked out after my dad told me this, and I'll always be grateful for what my dad did. What if my mom had never heard that man messing with the door? Or what if my dad was never there in the first place and was in his motor home? I will always think about that, and it still really scares me to this day. I worked the night shift in a supply storage room for a hospital about eight years ago. Usually the new people get stuck on night or weekend shifts at hospitals, and I was no exception. My job consisted of taking inventory of certain units, packing up the needed supplies in a cart, and then taking them to where they needed to be. The plus side of this shift is that I was all alone, with no department boss or manager around, as they worked only during the day. There were less interruptions during the night, as only a few people would knock on the door or call for supplies during any given night. All in all, it was a fairly relaxed shift, but quiet is not all it's cracked up to be, and hospitals can be quite spooky at night. First of all, not all lights are on in the hallways. Perhaps only every third light is lit, because it's considered quiet time. This adds to the dim, isolated feeling of empty halls and no other sounds but an occasional cart. For me, the sound of the squeaky wheel table they would use to push the dead bodies past my supply room to the morgue always gave me the creeps. This then brings me to the worst part of my hospital experience. The ghosts. I suppose no hospital is without them, as it is a place where many meet their end. We had one ghost in our supply room. The day shifters all knew of him, and when I started working there, they told me about it. I just rolled my eyes and thought they were just giving the newbie a hard time. But working alone at night, I had started noticing my box cutters would occasionally disappear from where I put them and then they would reappear in that same spot later on after I gave up looking for them. It was a bit creepy, but I also felt this one was harmless, 
a bit of a practical joker, if you will. It was the ghost in the surgery center, though, that scared me the most. I always dreaded going there every night to resupply, so I saved that place for the very last thing I had to do on my shift. The surgery center was a separate building on our campus, quite a bit away across huge parking lots and behind the other medical buildings. No one worked there at night. Each night I loaded up my carts and I had to put them on a truck that I had to drive to the surgery center. It was completely dark inside and out and the place I had to enter in the back had no lights outside and was also cut off from the view of the rest of the buildings. I could feel my hairs rising as I took the walk from the truck to the back door, hurrying to open it with my key and flick on the hallway light by the door. Propping the door open, I now had enough light to see the back of the truck and unload my supply carts. Pushing my car through the dim rooms was nerve-wracking because I just never knew what the ghost would do on any given night. Sometimes doors would open and shut, making me jump out of my skin. Other times I would hear dim laughter, sometimes amused voices. Sometimes cupboards and drawers would open and items would fall to the floor. After a while, I started to sing at the top of my lungs as I worked in that building, just so I couldn't hear them and could complete my tasks. No living people were around to hear my terrible singing, so it didn't matter how loud I was. I didn't tell my boss about any of my experiences, as I didn't want to seem like a wuss, but I didn't talk to someone who had that shift before I did, and they confirmed that the same things happened to them. I was really relieved to find out I wasn't crazy. I remember that I'd sometimes call my daughter from work and tell her I was headed to the haunted surgery center and if I didn't come home, she knew where to search. Happily, a day shift finally opened up after about a year, and I switched. I do miss the quiet, but I definitely don't miss the haunts. A couple of weeks ago, a friend and myself were going for a short night walk to cool off and hang out for a while. We're two non-binary people in our early 20s, we were walking in an area of town that's worse for wear, on a road with absolutely no street lights. I was familiar with the area, so I didn't feel incredibly nervous. However, there reached a certain point where I felt like someone was watching us. I then turned to my friend and said, I feel like we're being watched, but maybe I'm just feeling paranoid. We sort of just laughed it off and continued walking. Not even a minute later, a large truck came around the corner. It was a shiny new pickup truck with a lot of work equipment in the bed. We moved out of the way for the truck to pass, and as it drove past us, I felt relieved. However, the truck reached the end of the road, turned around, and then came back up to me and my friend. Now where the truck pulled up to me and my friend, it completely blocked us in against a concrete wall on all sides except one, and a direct line into the dark, thick woods. The window rolled down, and a clean-cut man smiled, and he then asked us if we lived in the area. My friend is very shy, so I started talking to the guy. I told him I didn't live around here, and the man inside then started asking me for directions. When I realized he was just lost, my fear eased up. He asked me if I knew where a specific road was, and then said a road that sounded completely made up. It was totally unfamiliar to me, and it was definitely not the name of any road for miles. I had asked him about some of the other roads that were sort of similar sounding to the name he said, in case he was confused or something. He then looked at me, and then said, No, look here. I have it pulled up on my GPS. I began walking closer to the truck to take a look at his phone. When I was about two feet away from his window, this very strong feeling that I was in danger then came over me, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I began panicking internally, but I tried my best to remain calm. I told him to hold his phone up, and he did. The GPS was open on his phone, but there was nothing plugged in. This really scared me. 
I began trying to think of a plan to escape at that point. I told him I didn't think I could help him, and that I was sorry. Well, for a brief second, he acted like he was going to drive away. He then smirked, looked me up and down, looked over at my friend, and I kid you not, he then asked us to have a threesome with him. As you can imagine, I was absolutely mortified by this. I was still frantically trying to think of a plan, realizing then that really our only option would be to run straight into the woods in the pitch black, with also a chance that he would follow us there. I told him that we would not be doing that and that he needed to get the hell out of there right now. But he just sat in his truck, still staring at me. This made me so angry, and I then started screaming at him. Get the fuck out of here, right now, fuck off. I berated him for probably about two minutes while he just sat and stared at me, still smiling. It was fucking horrifying. The way that he just sat and smiled, completely unfazed, was one of the scariest things I've ever personally experienced. I was getting ready to tell my friend to head into the woods, when right then, he finally started to drive off. After driving about five feet, he stopped, stuck his head out the window, and then asked, Okay, but what about for $300? I screamed at him again to get the fuck out of there, and he drove off for good. At this point, I became very concerned for mine and my friend's safety, fearing the man would return. I told my friend that we needed to run and get to my house as quickly as possible. We ran down a hill that was adjacent to the road, and we began cutting through people's yards to try and throw the man off if he returned to the spot. And at one point, we actually saw him driving around, so we hid behind a church. We did finally make it to a main brightly lit road, and I called my roommate, who walked to meet us on the street, and then walked the rest of the way home with us. I was absolutely terrified for the whole rest of the night, and I believe I've seen the same truck around a few times since then, but I really can't say for sure. All I know is the way that man smiled and stared at us while I cursed him out was terrifying, and I'm still very worried to this day that maybe someone else will encounter him on a dark road, and that he might find a new victim, but I really hope that doesn't happen. Let me start off by saying that I'm a 30-year-old male from a small town in Kentucky, and the story happened about four years ago. We're one of those small towns where you have to go to the next city over if you ever want to shop at Walmart or something. So I went to the city, which is about a 45-minute drive from my house. I was going to hang around the bar and hopefully meet a nice lady to have some fun with and just spend the night in a hotel. If I had known how that decision would have ended, I would have just stayed home. So I'm at the bar drinking my fifth or sixth beer, and a lady had actually approached me, which was cool with me because it saved me the effort and possibly some humiliation from striking out. She was pretty, and she seemed somewhat intelligent, and from the sound of it, she just wanted to hook up. She said that she lived right down the road, and I figured that would be better than paying for a hotel. Once again, good fortune on my part. So we took my car and went back to her house, and I spent the night there. Well, the next morning, the first thing she said to me was that I owed her $40. Well, the night before, while she was showing me around her home, she was also showing me her very large gun collection. I believe that somebody in an occupation like that should let somebody know in advance so they don't rack up a bill before getting hammered with this shit. But to each their own, I guess. And I really didn't want to take the chance of pissing her off at this particular moment. I mean, it's the dead of winter, and it's going to take my crappy-ass car some time to warm up and defrost. So I then tell her, Okay, I'll pay you the $40, but I have to go to the ATM first. We'll go pick up your car and use the ATM at the gas station next to the bar. First of all, I only had like $4 in my bank account, so I knew it wasn't going to end well. My car defrosted, and we drove to her car, so it could be defrosting too. The second that she was in her car starting it up, 
I sped the hell away from there, thinking that she wouldn't chase me with her windows like that. I was wrong. She was right on my ass. Whenever I sped up, so did she. We actually reached speeds of around 90 miles per hour right in the city, and not a single cop was to be found. I even ran two red lights to shake her, and I then drove home as fast as I could. With her being a gun lover and packing like she was, I do sometimes wonder what would have happened if I would have stopped at one of those red lights. I also want to make it clear that I would have never intentionally picked up a hooker. This could literally happen to anybody. Be careful with who you spend your time with at a bar. And as always, stay safe. I'm an 18 year old female and the story happened when I was around 15. Back then, I lived in a small town with my mom, my stepdad, and five of my younger siblings, all under 14 years old. At this time, I was very troubled in many ways. Depression and a major anxiety disorder made life hard for me, which led to me being easily manipulated and such. I had a friend who I'll call Jenny for the sake of the story. Me and Jenny had known each other for a bit over a year at that point, so we were pretty close. So when she called me at around 1am on a summer night, I picked up. Staying quiet so I wouldn't wake anyone else up in the house. She was really surprised that I had answered her at this time of the night, and she asked me to come to the shop nearby. She was bored and she wanted some company, and she was with her older brother who had already had his driver's license. I, for some odd reason, agreed. A decision that was very out of place for me. After all, I avoided social situations at all costs at that time. But hey, I was dumb back then. Sneaking out wasn't really something I had ever done before that night. But I managed to leave without waking anyone up. I met Jenny and her older brother, and we went driving around the small neighboring towns and blasted some music. Then, her brother had this amazing idea to go and get one of his older friends who was about 27 years old if I remember correctly, and go and hang out at this one spot at the forest. So we went. As we got there, it was pretty dark, even though it was summertime. I had my phone with me, and I was from time to time making sure my mom hadn't woken up, and seeing that I was gone and freaking out. We then had an idea to play hide and seek, or Jenny had the idea, and we went on. I ran into the forest and I then hid behind this huge rock, not that far from where Jenny's brother was counting to 40, and I then heard running footsteps coming from the direction where I'd come from, only to see Jenny running, looking freaked out as fuck, and I then stood up, trying to see what was going on. Jenny ran to me, and she then quickly managed to tell me that while she was trying to find a hiding spot just like everyone else, there was a strange man that had started to follow her. She first thought that it was her brother's friend, but it wasn't, and she just started to book it. I looked into the woods trying to see if I would see something out of place, only for Jenny to scream next to me and then point to my left. The man was now very fucking close to us, to the point that I could literally see some of his features. We then started to run deeper into the woods. The woods were pretty deep, but after some time, there would be some houses and later on a small town. We ran, not caring if we were followed because it was super strange for some grown ass man to be following some teenage girls in the woods in the middle of the night. We ran until we could see some houses. Frantically, we went and knocked on the door of this one house. An older woman opened the door just a few moments later. Seeing us two freaked out teenage girls, she thankfully let us in. She gave us some ice water and she asked what happened. Trying to catch my breath, I tried to answer her, but I was pretty much about to have a panic attack. After some time, we told her and her husband what had happened and that a man had followed us into the woods. The woman looked very worried my legs were all bloodied up since I had fallen over whilst running, since I was wearing some old sneakers and I had tripped, and she helped clean up my legs and bandaged them. They let us stay for a bit before they offered us a ride to see if Jenny's brother and his friend had left, because at this point, 
Jenny and I had realized that we had left them there. Of course, they were grown men, but we didn't know if the guy that was following us had a weapon or not. As we arrived at the parking lot where we had left the car, we saw that the car was gone now, and then we had the older couple drive us to our homes. We were very thankful to them since both of them believed us, and I do to this day believe that that man didn't have any good intentions if he caught us. As the older couple dropped me off in my house, I thanked them once again. They were so kind to us even though it was super late at night when we had ran to their doorstep. I said goodbye and I wished them a good and safe drive home. As I entered my house, I could see that everyone was still sleeping. I then went to the bathroom to take a shower. My mom was waiting for me as I exited the shower and she asked why I was taking a shower. I lied to her and I told her I just got super hot and couldn't sleep. Luckily for me, she was barely awake and she didn't see that my legs were all bandaged. After that night, me and Jenny kind of stopped being friends, but I heard through her brother that he and his friend had left when they tried to look for us but couldn't find us. I now live in a different city, and my family still don't know about this, but I'm not planning on telling them either. So yeah, if any of you also happen to go to the woods past midnight, please be careful. The story is about a ghost town of the Illinois border. The story takes place on the border of Illinois and Indiana just a few miles before you crossed into Robinson. For some context, my job as a moving driver takes me all around Indiana locally and sometimes out of the neighboring states. This is one of the days where I had traveled outside Indiana. As easy as the job for the day was, I got sent in a small delivery box truck by myself to Robinson, Illinois. The trip was around a 300 mile round trip, totaling five and a half hours. So to me, I was going to be getting off early that day. Solo rides are pretty boring and tend to drag out though, so I was using my phone for music as well as GPS to keep me entertained on the way to the delivery site. About an hour and a half into the drive, I started to get out into the country parts of the highway where service wasn't all too great. So unfortunately, my music wasn't able to stay on and the radio was pretty much static on all the good channels. At this point, it was a lot of driving in silence down a highway of cornfields before my GPS then instructed me to turn down a country line road instead of remaining on the main streets and highways. This was a bit weird to me because usually crossing state borders is always faster when you stay on the highway, but to me, the GPS knows best and I didn't really think anything of it just thinner roads closer to the Indiana cornfields. At this point, I did lose all service though, because I was pretty much out in the middle of nowhere besides the occasional houses, trailers, or barns that you normally see on the backcountry roads. So my GPS was the only thing I could get to work. Thank God for that at least. I was approaching my destination and was only around 30 to 45 minutes away when I came to a fork in the road that had a house in the corner selling pumpkins. Passing that was a warehouse with a lot of John Deere equipment out front, and after that, a body shop. This'll be important for later. Passing all these things up, I kept down the beaten path for probably another 10 miles before I then came to a four-way stop in one of those really old towns that you usually see in every place you go. I think you know what I'm talking about old brick buildings and gas stations that barely look functional, something straight out of a backwoods horror movie, but it felt a little off to me. I'm not sure why, but I was just really anxious for some reason. Turning from the four-way to continue following my GPS, I was looking around at this town, and it only really consisted of four to five ranch-style homes that barely even looked inhabitable. There was a brick building with the words barbershop painted across it, and then some other rundown brick buildings that I assume were shops. No cars, no people, and no animals. I mean, literally nothing. There was no sign of life for this two mile stretch of town. This isn't too odd. I mean, towns are abandoned all the time, but this was just creepy. So I just kept on through, 
until I came across two buildings that really threw me over the top. On the outskirts of the town, there was this big colonial style house covered in vines and a vegetation yard that seemed kept up, but not in a super nice way and just seemed like a home the wrong kind of people own because they don't know how to do any upkeep. And second, across the stretch, an old dilapidated church that looked to be built in the early 1800s. I'm talking Salem Witch Trials level of aging. It had pentagram spray painted on the windows and a graveyard on the side of it with a fence around it in pieces. But judging from how the building looked, I assumed it was abandoned terrifying nonetheless, and after passing it, something happened that I can only describe as paranormal or straight from a book of ghosts and demonic presences. It started with my cheek getting extremely cold out of nowhere, only my cheek and nothing else. Then an overwhelmingly strong sense of fear and anxiety rushed over my entire body. After that, I began to smell something really horrible it was pugent for at least a mile after I passed that church. I was in a panic because I'm a firm believer in the afterlife and ghosts, so I called my significant other to talk me down, and we just ended up laughing it off before I hung up because my phone was almost dead at this point, and I really needed the GPS to get back. It was probably another 10 minutes before I came into contact with any other building or signs of life with actual people in it. I passed by a big sign for the running sheriff of the town, a water tower, and then finally, the Illinois border. After that, it was business as usual. Completed my delivery, signed the paperwork, and organized my truck, then left to go back home. I reversed my GPS so it took me the same way because it was the fastest, and in the back of my mind, I was thinking about the town and how it's going to suck to drive back through it. But with my phone dying, I had to follow the same way in case it died, and I'd have to just wing it to get home. It was within the first 45 minutes of the whole two and a half hour drive, so it'd be over sooner than later, right? While on the way, I was passing all the usual stuff that I made mental notes of. The Indiana border this time, the water tower, and the sign for Sheriff Bobbitt, and then through the town and onto the county road that took me to the four-way. I still wasn't playing any music to conserve my phone battery. I was just driving and looking at the sights for a while. Then I realized something. Peeking out the window, I had spotted the body shop that I had passed earlier that day. I was puzzled at first, and I thought it might have just been a different one, until I double checked myself with the warehouse selling all the John Deere equipment, and then pulling up to the fork in the road. I had a stop sign of the way, and I chose to go from the fork, and I looked out to see the brick house, the one selling pumpkins. I sat at the stop sign for a minute, and I flicked back through my GPS. I know that this road led to a four-way. That's where the town was, right? I've recognized everything here from before it and after it. Did I just zone out and not pay attention? Flicking through the GPS all the way back to the border, I realized that the county road in the fork takes you straight to the Robinson border. No turns needed. Not a single four-way turned into the direction of the town I did my delivery at. Nothing. I thought maybe I just mixed up my locations. So I continued all the way back, looking for any possible place that was close to what I saw. But nothing. All the way back to the highway, not a single thing looked close to what those buildings looked like. I finally gave up, but I did panic a little bit on the way home. Nothing ever happened on the drive home that resembled those feelings. No cold cheeks, no horrible smell, nothing. Just a lot of fear from seeing something that I don't think anyone was ever meant to see. So if you ever find yourself coming down County Line 63 by Prairie Creek, and you find that fork in the road, please pass the four-way that follows a couple miles down the road if that's there for you. Be careful out there. This happened almost a year ago, and I've only told a few people about it. But for some reason, I found myself thinking back to it a lot lately. I was walking home from Walmart. 
It was close to 10 p.m. Our town is tiny and uneventful, and every establishment apart from the couple of 24-hour convenience stores close at no later than 11 p.m. So, usually at this hour, there aren't very many people out. That night, however, as I was walking, I suddenly heard what sounded like a man and a woman yelling. It was coming from a parking lot a little ways up in the direction that I was walking. I couldn't make out anything that was being said yet due to still being a relative distance away and I initially presumed it to be an average verbal dispute. But as I got closer though, I quickly realized it was far more serious than a mere lover spat. The man was repeatedly shouting threats and derogatory obscenities at the woman at the top of his lungs and the woman in turn was screaming at him in an extremely anguished tone to leave her alone. I had no doubt that the man was attempting to harm the woman if he hadn't already done so, and I then quickly dialed 911. By this time, I was close enough to the parking lot to where I could be seen by them if they happened to look in my direction. So while on the phone, I kept my voice down, and I tried to outwardly mimic the body language of being in a casual phone conversation. This guy undoubtedly came across as the retaliatory sort, and if he knew I was calling the cops on him, I could be his next target. Because their screaming continued during the phone call, the dispatcher heard it and rightfully picked up on how serious the situation was. I described my location to them as concisely as I could, and within minutes, two police vehicles arrived. One was a van, and the other was a standard squad car. And the time between the phone call and the cops arriving the people had walked away from the parking lot that they were initially in, and they then crossed to the other side of the street, and they began walking towards another parking lot a short ways down in the other direction. When they reached the point of being directly across from me, the woman looked at me, made eye contact, and then pleaded, Please call the cops! I gave her a quick, subtle nod, and made a slight quick gesture with the phone in my hand to assure her that I was doing exactly that. She seemed to get the hint, because immediately after I did that, she then screamed, Your ass is going to jail! At the man. It turned out that the parking lot they were heading towards was where the woman's vehicle was at, and she had been trying to make her way to it, but the man kept following her. This parking lot was where the cops met up with them. I, of course, continued to stay at a safe distance on the sidewalk that I was already on on the other side of the street. The cops first interrogated the man, who loudly argued with them and tried to play off the situation as a heated verbal dispute. With how much he raised his voice, I could make out of most of what he said even at the distance I was at, and he essentially claimed that he had recently broken up with her for cheating on him and that she kept following him. I stood there just thinking, yeah, uh, this is such bullshit. I really hope the cops see through it. There were three officers on the scene in total, and two of them stay with the man, while the third went over and talked to the woman. Now, she spoke much more softly than the man, so I couldn't really hear what she told them. But apparently, it was very damning, because the next thing I saw was the man getting cuffed and then put into the police van, which then drove off. My guess would be then he was being taken in for questioning, at the very least. After the third officer finished talking to the woman, she was able to get in her vehicle and drive away safely. This assured me that at the very least, she was in stable enough condition to drive steadily, which I was relieved about. After she left, the third officer walked over to me, and he asked if I was the one who called them. I then confirmed that I was. He asked me a few more questions, such as if I knew either of the people personally. I didn't, as well as any other details I could recall and then they took down my info for records. I remember continually thinking to myself that I very likely saved that woman from being severely harmed or possibly even saved her life. Like I said earlier, few people were out at that hour in our town, and if I hadn't happened to be walking home from Walmart right at that moment, who really knows if there would have been anyone else around to intervene. I sincerely hope that woman was able to stay safe from him and is also in a better place in her life these days. I work the overnight shift for a small organization for executive protection agents. 
Let's call the organization Black Tie Protection for the sake of this story. We're all ex-military police officers or highway patrolmen. In total, there are about six of us full-time and also a handful of part-timers. Essentially, we worked for a large-scale manufacturing company, but moreover, we're personal armed guards for the owner and his family. They are a wealthy family in the small community, and with that, there becomes some troubles every once in a while, and that's where we step in. We ran 12-hour shifts, two guards per shift. My normal partner's name was Austin, but we all used his call sign, Coma. I know that seems weird, but long story short, this tough son of a bitch took a sniper round right in the helmet in his early service days and stood right back up to finish the fight, only to pass out after the fighting had finished and he was actually in a coma for weeks before coming to again. Needless to say, he's a good partner to have. Our normal shift consisted of one of us walking the empty building at night while the other sits at the guard station next to the owner's huge house watching the property, as well as the video camera feeds. The first of the two stories happened about a year after I started. People say that things happen when you least expect it, and that's exactly what happened. We had been doing our normal rounds and joking back and forth over the radio when I received a strange call over our secured radios. There was a slurred deep voice, can anyone hear me? I clicked the radio with the response. Coma? Is that you messing with me? He answered back quickly that it wasn't him. Then he said to whoever's on the line that it's a secure channel. After a few moments of silence, there was yet another strange call. It was the slurred deep voice again. Okay, good. You can hear me. I need you to help the person in the old house. I can't control myself for much longer. Then the radio goes silent. I immediately got back to the guard station, and both Coma and I tried multiple times to get whoever was on the radio to answer again, but there was no response. After a brief moment, the only old house we knew was the house that the owner had grown up in, and it wasn't that far off the property, and he keeps it out of nostalgia. We decided to go check it out. We got geared up and we jumped into the truck, then drove over to the old property. Now, this isn't a rundown house by any means. It was a nice two-story house. It had a really big pool in the backyard, and it was very well kept. The first thing we noticed upon arriving was that the light that's usually left on in the upstairs room was off. There was an eerie stillness in the air. We made entry, and we started clearing the room one by one, and after what seemed like an hour of stress, we had finally cleared the entire house. Looking around once we regrouped, Confused Coma then said to me, Yeah, I think this was all just a prank. And just as we were about to leave, the radio cracked on again. Once again, the slurred deep voice. Oh no, it looks like you were too late. I guess it's a good thing no one uses the pool anymore. Then silence again. We rushed down and we all looked at the pool, but nothing. Getting frustrated and feeling played, we were just about to leave. When I had spotted the pool house door was a little cracked. Using hand signs, I gestured guard up and moved towards the pool house. Upon getting to the pool house building, we burst through the door, our guns drawn, to then find something that still haunts me to this day. There was a female, maybe 20 years old, and she was stabbed so many times it looked like her body was Swiss cheese. Upon finding her, I had rushed to her side while Coma held the position at the door. Now, I had combat medic experience, so I had tried to find a pulse, but I didn't find one. Upon laying her down to try CPR, I realized her head had almost been cut off. After gathering myself, I also realized there was a smile drawn in blood right on her face and the word almost written on her forehead. We called the police and we secured the scene the best we could. It took about two weeks 
But we finally heard the sick person that had done this awful act was a known convict that had actually been released only days before. He had lured the poor girl into the house by claiming it was his. That drawn on smile still haunts me to this day. The second story isn't so graphic, but still equally terrifying. Now, as the owner of a large company in a small area, the family I work for employs a ton of local people. And unfortunately, sometimes those employees have to be let go for one reason or another. I would imagine leaving the ex-employees upset and feeling cheated. The family had went to Florida on vacation, and they left their house empty, which means that along with all of our other duties, we had to walk outside the house as well every hour. Now, to explain this story, you have to understand the layout of the owner's house. It's a giant four-story house that can only be described as a mansion. The ground level floor is all an open, huge living room. There's also a kitchen with two full bathrooms, a huge walk-in laundry room, and a basement. It's a full house on its own with another kitchen and three bedrooms, as well as a game room. And the top two floors are all bedrooms with a movie theater and a huge walkout balcony. It was about 1 a.m. when we got the first burglar alarm. We rushed to the house, but we didn't find anything out of order. The doors and long garage were still closed. No motion or lights. Now, this might seem like a huge red flag, but with the winds we experience, it's not uncommon for a false alarm, because the wind will push the doors, making the alarm think someone's trying to enter the house. After clearing the outside, we decided to call the owner. The owner answered, and he had been sleeping. I then said, Hey, sorry to call so late, but we got an alarm, and we wanted to know if you could pull up the cameras and check to see if anything looks out of the norm. After a few minutes of hearing him type into his computer, he said no, everything looked good, and it must have just been the wind again. That's what I thought, I answered but I just wanted to make sure. He told us that he appreciated us calling and being vigilant about it, and he told us to have a safe night, then hung up. We went on about our business as usual for the rest of the night, that is, until shift change was about to happen. It was about 5.45 a.m., and we got a motion detection alarm in the house. Now, this was a huge problem. Seeing a door alarm was one thing, but motion in the house wasn't something that could have just been the wind. We geared up and made entry. Since the day shift had come in, there were now four of us. Coma and I from the night shift, and two day shifters. We had Josh and Devin. Josh was call sign Phantom, and Devin call sign Sharpshooter. We all took one floor and did a full sweep. I took the basement, Coma on the ground floor, Phantom 3rd, and Sharpshooter on the 4th. Everything was going pretty smoothly. That is, until the radio cracked alive. Team, be on alert. I have the balcony door opened on the 4th floor with footprints. Sharpshooter said. It looks like someone made a makeshift grapple hook and climbed a rope to the balcony. On edge, everyone checked in and continued the sweep. As I'm almost through my floor... I hear a noise coming from the last room that I needed to clear. As I prepared to enter the room trying to be as quiet as possible, the radio cracked again. Team, we'll meet on the ground floor ASAP, and then pair up to finish the sweep. Fuck. I thought that whoever was in this room knows I'm here. Less than a second later, the door swings open, and a man then rushes at me swinging a knife, cutting my forearm trying to get up to the stairs. I radio that we have an armed tango headed to the stairs from the basement. As I get to the last stair, I lunge forward and I grab the man by the ankle, causing him to fall forward onto the ground floor landing. I fought to free the knife and get on top of him, just as Coma threw handcuffs on him. As we got his ID and information, we put the story together. Apparently, he was a recently fired employee. The reason he was let go was because of less jobs coming in and the money was getting tight, and since he was the last hired, he was the first to be released. 
but when he heard the family was going on a lavish vacation, he got enraged and drunk, and he decided to break into the house while they were all on vacation, then hide in the house until they got back. The scariest part was that the room he was hiding in, he had enough chairs for the entire family, with robes, duct tape, multiple hunting knives, two bottles of gasoline, and matches. I got 27 stitches out of the ordeal, and while he told the police he was just wanting to talk to the owner, all of the evidence left behind tells a much, much scarier story. I'm not really sure what else ended up happening to him, but I definitely hope he got the help he most definitely needed. My name is Renee. I'm a 19-year-old female living in North Carolina. I went to college for two years, and I then dropped out my sophomore year. When I returned home, I got a fast food job just to have some money in my pocket until I figured out my next move. When I worked at this job, I worked mostly night shifts since they paid the most money. It was pretty simple, and it wasn't that busy, so I was just on my phone most of the time. Anyway, one night around 2 a.m., I had heard a noise on the headset, which meant someone had pulled up to the drive through I just did the usual, Hello, what can I get for you? The person in the car didn't respond, and instead pulled up to the window. I then opened the window, and I told them they had to order at the speaker, not at the window. They then proceeded to ask me if I had change for a $20 bill. I told them I couldn't give them change unless they bought something. Then they asked me again, and again, I told them the same answer. The driver ended up saying, How hard is it to just give us change? I told them that I wasn't allowed to do that, and they had to buy something first, or go somewhere else, and then I closed the window. The driver got out of the car and started banging on the window, then tried to open it. I went and got the manager that was closing with me that night, and I told her the situation. She then told me to stay in the office while she went to handle it. Around 15 minutes later, I had heard police cars around the building. Apparently, the people in the car pulled out a gun on my manager and basically tried to rob her. My manager and I gave descriptions to the police, and we closed the store early, then went home. I never heard anything else from the incident, but I'm just really relieved me and my manager survived that night as it really could have ended up a whole lot worse. I work in the medical field now as a CNA, and I've always been really interested in physical science, but I'm also interested in psychology. I plan to go back to school to become a psych nurse to meld those two interests together, and I know I can do well at it because of my previous job experience. This previous job experience required no experience, and looking back, I'm not really quite sure why I didn't. This job was the first of this kind that I had ever tried my hand at, and it had a very high turnover rate. It was stressful, and I even went home in tears a few times. I worked second shift, 1500 to 2300. This job was at a mental facility. It's a step down facility from the state mental ward. This means that we couldn't use restraints as a facility, unlike the ward that can, but this place, it had a spiel. We're one of the only 30 facilities throughout the entirety of the United States that deal specifically with people with schizophrenia. There were over 120 residents and usually only five to seven staff members at any given time. You would think this would be a controlled environment but you would be wrong. There were no fences, no gates, no locking doors, no knives, and no way at all to defend yourself. Some of the residents got violent. I had a number of things thrown at me, not limited to burning cigarettes and bodily fluids. I have been grabbed, shoved, kicked, scratched, and punched, and hands thrown at me. One person would try to bite. Another sharpened the handle of a toothbrush and nearly shanked me. But then you have the quiet ones. They usually keep quiet because they're listening to the voices, and you have to watch their body language closely just to make sure they're not about to rush anyone. 
We also had a group of residents that were court ordered to be there. For the most part, they were calm, mainly because they didn't want to go back to jail. I got put in charge of that group after an incident in the med line, where I stood in between two of them starting to fight. Hands were being thrown over me, but I stood my ground, and I told the one resident to stop. If he hit me, I would be able to do nothing, but he would go back to jail. Things died down quick. It was overall a good job, but the mood of the place was like walking through dense fog. The strong delusions of the residents. One of them told me that her toilet was clogged because her roommate had been pregnant the previous year with devil dogs. That she gave birth, freezed them, and had just tried to flush them. But what always got to me was the walkers. The people who would just walk in pace while mumbling nonsense. Usually it was just nonsense, but sometimes it was very to the point. I would hear about crimes, murder, rape, things the voices were telling them to do. I made the mistake of asking what the voices were telling a very distraught resident to do. His face changed. He very calmly made eye contact, and he told me he was going to kill me, strangle me with his bare hands until I stopped kicking. Another one that paced would take me by the face and staring into me, telling me I had beautiful eyes. I would have to gingerly back away and report it because she was being symptomatic. She had actually gouged her own mother's eyes out. The worst of it was at night. Many of the residents had insomnia, and if the Syroquil didn't knock them out, they would pace around the grounds of the facility in the dark. To be walking in the dark and hear footsteps turn and quicken behind you knowing full well you're surrounded by people not in their right minds and then hear manic laughter. Well, you turn to ice. Don't panic. Don't show fear. You have to steer yourself, then turn and face them. Hi, can I help you? Are you doing alright? The response back was always something along the lines of, Fine. Even though they were yards from you moments ago, and now they're right up to your nose. The strangest one that I could never figure out was the full adult handprint on the inside of my car. I had locked it. It had an alarm. But there I found it. Fogged on the inside of my back window. Single. Alone. Nothing disturbed in the entire car. It was the end of the shift at this point, and I know it wasn't there at the beginning. The doors were all still locked too and my car keys had been in my bag in a locker the entire shift. That's all I have for that one, but I do have more. I'm currently working at a nursing home on second shift. The sundowners can really be a handful. The scary encounter happened to me when I left my homeland of Australia. I didn't really have a choice. I had just gotten out of a very abusive two-year marriage, yet I still wasn't free from my ex-husband. It was a very painful choice to leave behind my family, as we were extremely close, as well as leaving my country, Australia. But I needed to make a change for my own future happiness. Here's a little background. I'm a fitness professional and an elite athlete. I decided to move to L.A., the fitness capital of the world. I packed my whole life into two suitcases, and I then set off to start a new life. I was filled with excitement and anxiety, and fear of the unknown. I had nowhere to live, no job, or family or friends. I was on my own. I touched down in LA, checked into my hotel, and started to look for a place to live and a job. I found a great apartment one street back from Melrose Avenue. It was a great location, as I didn't have a car, so basically I just walked everywhere. After a week of handing out my resumes, I had landed a great position as a head trainer at a 24-hour gym. I was so excited. The gym was only a 25-minute walk from my apartment. My shift was from 4 p.m. to midnight, which I loved. I got to train during the day, which was perfect. I had settled in beautifully. I had made some really great friends, and I had also met a really great guy. He was from Canada. 
life was finally falling into place, and it felt great. Now, coming from Australia and being raised on property life was pretty drama-free. So, walking home from work in LA at midnight, I truly never gave it much thought. Don't get me wrong, I was always careful, but I was never really worried. What an idiot I was. On this particular night, I'd stayed late, as my coworker was running late for their shift. No big deal. I left the gym and I started my walk home around 1 a.m. Now, my walk home was mostly very well lit on the main drag. However, the street I lived on was extremely dark with lots of trees. My apartment was about 200 meters down after you went off the main drag. It was a beautiful night. As I was walking home, I noticed a very large dark-skinned man standing at the bus stop. The bus stop was just before my street. This guy was about six foot tall and at least 300 pounds. A big guy. Now remember, I'm a fitness professional, so I know physiques, and I noticed him right away. We made some eye contact, and I instantly felt the hairs go up on my back of my neck, and I felt panicked. The guy wasn't checking me out like, oh, she's cute. Oh, no. I felt his intentions right there through that stare, and they were not good. I could feel my stomach turning, and my heart was beating right out of my chest, as if I had just finished the 100-meter Olympic final. As I walked right past him with a purposeful walk, I could feel his eyes boring into my soul. I didn't dare look at him again. I really didn't want any type of conversation with him or give him any opportunity to approach me. So I walked past him, and with every step as I walked by, I could feel my pulse quickening. When I finally passed him, my fear only increased, as I then realized he's now behind me and I can't see him. I'm a strong fit woman, 5 foot 7 at 135 pounds, but I'm clearly no match for a big guy like him. As I turned onto my street, the terror was now full on reality, as my street is pitch black. No street lights and lots of trees as I mentioned before. I was walking so fast now. I reached into my hip pouch and I pulled out my keys, placing them between my fingers and held on tightly. My heart was pounding in my ears. All of a sudden, I hear these really loud footsteps running up full speed behind me. I spun around to see this big huge guy standing right in front of me and I screamed out loud. He then grabbed me with both hands, clutching my clothes. I was still clutching my keys and I had punched him in the face as hard as I could. Right at about that time, I then saw a car driving down my street towards us. The car started to flash its lights and beep the horn. This sent the big guy scrambling off and he ran away. As the car then pulled over, I jumped back away as the person in the car then rolled down the window. I was crying hysterically. The adrenaline was pumping and I was just trying to make sense of what had just happened. The person then told me to get in the car that they'll drive me home. They said that they worked out at my gym and that they recognized me. They also showed me their membership and license. And they then said, Please get in the car. I just want to help you. That guy went into the car in the alleyway. There's actually two guys, and I don't think they're done messing with you. My mind was racing as I then got into his car. I was crying so hard as the realization then washed over me of what just happened and what could have happened. I know that night I had a very special angel watching over me. That experience opened my eyes as well as my awareness to all of my surroundings. When you feel something isn't right, trust your inner voice. I'm so very glad I did. That night is a night that I will never forget and the sound of those heavy footsteps will forever be etched into my brain. I don't ever want to experience anything like that again. Stay safe and stay alert. So this happened yesterday and I'm still pretty shaken up. Just for some backstory, I'm a 25 year old female and my boyfriend and I both have jobs where we can work from home and in an office. 
I was extremely tired yesterday morning, so I decided to work from home as my boyfriend went into the office. So I was alone all day with just my dog and cat at home with me. The day was normal as any other work day from home that I've taken until about 1.30 p.m. This is where things took a turn. I had just hopped into a work meeting when my doorbell rang. We have one of those ring doorbells with a camera and it notifies my boyfriend's phone that someone's at the door. I texted my boyfriend and I asked if he could check who it was and he said it was an older man who looked kind of sketchy and did not answer the door. So I ignore the door and go back to my meeting. 20 minutes later, I'm done with my meeting and I decided to check my phone. I always keep my phone on do not disturb while I'm working. And as soon as I checked it, I noticed all of the calls and texts that I'd missed from my boyfriend. Panicked, I immediately called him back and he frantically asked me why I haven't been answering. I told him I was in a work meeting and he tells me to look out the window as the man hasn't left our property yet. I very quietly walk over to the front windows of our house and peek out. And sure enough, the man's in our driveway. He had parked his old beat up truck next to our car in our driveway and he was looking back and forth very sketchily. He had on dirty jeans and a dirty gray tank top. I immediately run back to our bedroom and at this point, my heart is pounding in my chest. I tried to comfort myself by just saying that maybe he had the wrong house, but no. The man began looking through our windows trying to see inside and he proceeded to try and open our back gate which was locked. As I mentioned earlier, I have a large dog and at this point, my dog is snapping and growling at the front door. As I still had my boyfriend on the phone and he was actively watching the man on the camera app on his phone, I asked him what I should do since I was in full panic mode and completely alone. Call 911, he firmly said. I did as he said and with shaky hands I called. While I waited for the police to arrive, I texted my mom to let her know of the situation and she immediately dropped what she was doing and said she was on her way. The man was still snooping around the house and looking through our windows. At this point, I had no idea what his intentions were, but by the looks of it, they didn't seem good and I was really afraid he would see me. As soon as the man saw the police coming down the road, he hopped in his truck and sped off. I ran outside to the officer and at this point my mom had arrived as well. In tears, I explained what happened and thankfully my mom got the man's license plate number. The police took his license plate number as well as description and they told me they'd be on lookout for him. I know this may not seem as scary as some of the other stories here, but when you're alone and there's a man looking through your windows and not leaving your property, you have no idea what his intentions are, and it's absolutely terrifying. I wasn't able to sleep last night because I was so terrified, thinking he would come back to try and finish what he started. I'm hoping the police call me with an update since we had the license plate number. And if they do, I will provide an update. And to the strange man who wouldn't leave my property, please don't come back again. For context, I'm a girl, and the story took place when I was 18 years old. At the time, I was living with my father, but he was working long shifts away from home, so I spent a lot of time alone. One day I was home alone and trying to study in my bedroom. It was around 7 p.m. and dark outside. I was used to studying alone like this with my headphones on. My bedroom was at the back of the house facing the garden, which has a gate at the back leading to a large field. It wasn't unusual to get distracted by the occasional noise at night because the fields were really popular with dog walkers. This time though, it was different. I was trying to focus on my homework when a bright light came streaming through the window. I peeked out expecting to see a person and their dog, but I couldn't locate the source of the light. I went back to what I was doing, assuming it was someone walking who'd accidentally shone the light at my window. The next night it happens again. 
a bright light through my window, specifically with no dog walker in sight. This time I was frustrated, and I questioned if it could be the same person being creepy or trying to see into my room as I kept the curtains open. I spent longer looking out the window this time, trying to figure out the source of the light. I soon realized it was coming from somewhere close. It was coming from my own garden, and the gate connecting to the fields seemed to be open. My heart started beating really fast, and I didn't know what to do. I quickly texted my dad, saying that I thought someone was in the garden. He told me to make sure that all of the doors were locked, and that he'd be home as soon as he could. I snug down the stairs as quietly as possible, not wanting whoever was outside to know I was there. I checked the front door, and thank God it was locked. I crept to the back door facing the garden, and just as I was about to check it, I then saw the handle going down, like someone was trying to open the door. Thankfully, that door was locked too, but they did try a few times to open it. By this point, I was absolutely terrified and shaking. I heard them try and pull at the kitchen window as well, but they had no luck. I tried to get a look at the person, but all I could tell was that they were white and tall. It was too dark to pick out any features. They seemed to be getting frustrated now, and then started banging at the window like they wanted to force it to break or open. I looked towards the front of the house, and my dad's car still wasn't there, and I was getting worried. Then by some miracle, I heard my neighbor's back door open, and their large dog barking loudly. They must have noticed the stranger, and then let out their dogs to scare them away. And it worked. I haven't seen them around again. I've never been so thankful for my neighbor's loud dogs before, and now I always check the doors are locked, even more than I used to. This happened when I was 17. I'm 22 now, and still thinking about it haunts me to this day. I was at my house on a Friday night. My mother was out of town for the weekend visiting some friends, so I had the house all to myself for the weekend. That night, I invited my friend Dan over for the night, and we decided to watch a scary movie. We got some snacks and soda, and we then turned on my favorite horror movie of all time, which has dragged me to hell. The one where that loan officer denies an old woman's request for an extension on her mortgage, and she then gets a curse put on her, where she has to break it within three days, or she'll get literally dragged to hell. Anyways, about an hour into the movie, me and Dan were having a good time and laughing at random shit in the movie. I paused the movie because I had to go to the bathroom, and just as I walked into the bathroom, I saw out the window that the sky looked green. I knew that there was going to be a storm, but I didn't pay attention to it. So I did my business, washed up, and went to continue the movie. Well, after the movie was over, me and Dan got an alert on our phones. The alert said that there was going to be a tornado warning until 7.45 p.m. and to seek shelter now and that the threat level was really extreme. We immediately left the house to get to the storm shelter in the trailer park. Yeah, I lived in a trailer park at the time, so we had to evacuate the trailer. Just as we got to the storm shelter, that was when all of the sirens started to go off and the wind started to get violent. The owner of the trailer park unlocked the shelter, and us, and everyone else in the trailer park got inside of it. We went down to the basement and all huddled. About 10 minutes later, the power went out, and we could all hear the wind getting really violent, and what sounded like a freight train shook the whole building. It shook so violently that I actually thought it was going to collapse. I started crying, and I thought we were going to die. Me, Dan, and everyone else in the shelter started freaking out. There were five loud crashing sounds that came from outside. I was so terrified that I felt like I was going to shit myself. We then heard a loud roar of the tornado's wind from outside through the structure of the building. Then about ten minutes of noise later, it stopped. We were then given the all clear. We all left the shelter, and from the damage we all saw, I couldn't believe it. To say the damage was crazy is an understatement. 
There were a few cars flipped upside down, a couple of trees were uprooted, and three houses were damaged. Two others were completely leveled, and another house had a car crash into it. Me and Dan hugged each other tightly while crying hysterically, because we were really glad to be alive. We were probably doing this for about 15 minutes. Then we walked back to my house. Luckily, all it had was just a little bit of side damage. Dan also lived in the trailer park at the time. Dan's mom and sister said when they got back to their house, there was damage to the roof. I invited Dan to spend the night at my house tonight. He agreed since he was still terrified. His mom and sister were cool with it too. I know this isn't the typical story with a creeper, but it was still terrifying, and I will never forget that day. For a little reference about me, I was around 13 or 14 at the time. I lived with my mother, as well as my little sister, who was 9 or 10 at the time, as well as my Maltese dog. We lived in a two-story house that was like one of those homes that are smooched together as like one house. Ours were on the right if you looked at it from the road, and our neighbors were on the left side. The area that we lived in was very low income and had very high crime rates in North Carolina. Now that you know a little bit about it, I can continue with the story. It was a late summer night, around 10 or 11 p.m. My mother told me that she was going to go and pick up a boyfriend that she had been seeing at the time, and that me and my sister would be home alone. She left the house soon after, and I started playing my Xbox for a couple of hours. Later at around 12 a.m., I was hungry, and I went downstairs to go and get a few snacks before I went to bed that night. I can remember vividly that I was in my small kitchen grabbing Takis and also drinking milk from the carton like a dumb teenager when I had the sixth sense feeling coming over me, like that there was someone or something watching me. In my kitchen, it's very small, and it's also integrated with the dining room. In the dining room is a huge window that lets you see into the clothing lining and backyard that we shared with our neighbors. The window wasn't fully open, but the curtains weren't the best, and you can still see if the lights are on. I felt like I was being watched from that window as I was doing my late night food raid. My dog sensed this feeling as well, and he too started staring out the window, until I quickly grabbed the rest of my food and went upstairs. When I went upstairs, I crashed on the bed and I tried to get some sleep. I woke up at around 12.30am to feel and hear my dog jumping off my bed and then run downstairs. I quickly fell back to sleep until I then heard my dog continually barking and growling from downstairs. After him barking for a steady five minutes, I yelled from my bed for him to shut the hell up, and as soon as I yelled, I then heard a loud crash from my living room, as if something really big fell down from an elevated place. I snapped my head up, and I tiptoed to my stairs. I then carefully went down to the stairs, with my heart banging out of my chest. My dog had gone completely silent, and somehow my sister was still dead asleep in her room. When I got to the last four steps of the stairs, I could poke my head around the corner, and I could see into the living room where all of the commotion came from. When I looked slowly, I saw our AC unit that we had put on our window was in the floor. The window where it was installed was fully open, and there was a black gloved hand that was in the middle of reaching in when the person who was trying to get in saw my face and then slammed the screen window that was connected shut. My dog was near the dining room table and was just staring. When the screen window slammed shut, I sprinted up the stairs two at a time and into my mother's room where her phone was. My mother always told me to only use it if there was ever an emergency. I scrambled to put her number in and I desperately waited for her to pick up at the top of my stairs, terrified to go back down the stairs. My mom picks up and she asks if I'm okay, but I just yell into the phone, saying someone tried to break in. She says for me to stay on the phone and to grab my sister and then go next door to my neighbors. When I go to my sister's room, I shake her awake and then frantically tell her to get up. 
Now, my sister isn't the most friendliest person with being suddenly awoken because she was groggy and she had no awareness of what was going on until I literally picked her up out of the bed. I wasn't the strongest kid in the world at the time, but I did play football and with all of the adrenaline rushing, I hauled her up with no problem and I ran down the stairs with her in my arms in a firefighter carry. I slammed my body out the front door and I ran right next door to my neighbors banging on the front door. I felt like I was standing there for an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only 30 seconds with still no answer from my neighbors. In my head, I just said, fuck it, and I started running down the street in my bare feet with my sister behind me, who was now full awake and fully aware of the seriousness of the situation at hand. With our stroke of luck, there were two men who were coming off of a night shift at the nearby McDonald's, and they were driving down the road in my neighborhood. I ran right in front of the car, not even caring if I got hit, and I then screamed for them to help us. The first guy who got out and was driving asked if we were okay, and I told him what happened. I was still on the phone with my mother, and she then screamed at me, asking who we were talking to, and I handed the phone to the guy who talked to my mother, who told her we were alright. He then told us we could wait inside his car while him and his friend checked out our house, as well as around it for the person who did this. It was honestly a blur of just how long we waited until my mom got there, but the police were called at some point. I was coming off my adrenaline at that point, and it all really hit me at once. I later found out that the person who broke in was doing it to all the nearby houses all week, and ours was the only one where they could actually break it open. As far as I know, they never found the person, and we ended up moving out of that house soon after. It still really creeps me out to this day on what could have possibly happened, if I wouldn't have been such a light sleeper. But thank God I'm not. My parents live in a huge two-story blue Victorian house on six acres in rural Texas. It has the foyer in the middle where the front door is with two large normal side windows to each side of the door. This house has four bedrooms and three and a half bathrooms over 3,200 square feet. The curved staircase starts to the left across from the left window to the front door. If you stand outside, you're looking up the stairs from that window. My room is upstairs and to the right with a large set of bay windows at the front. It makes it so that I can look out to each of the three windows to see each side of the house in the front. I hope that makes sense. I was 18 and home alone as my family left and went to Florida while I was working and I didn't have the vacation time to leave with them. So I have this huge house in the middle of nowhere, Texas, all to myself, with my cat Oscar. Now, I sleep with my door pushed to, but not closed, so that the cat can come in and out of my room in the night and not wake me up. I'm dead asleep, and I'm awoken by a loud banging on the front door. It's 3 a.m. Like, what the hell? I go to the left side bay window, and peek out the window. I see a sheriff's cruiser in the side driveway. What the hell? What's going on? I think to myself. I go to my bedroom door and it's closed and locked. Again, what the hell? I unlock it and I go to the top of the stairs. I then yell down to the man at the door. He comes to the left window next to the door, yelling, Hey mama, you okay? Let me in. So I yell back down to him to put his badge on the window so I can see it. He pulls his badge out while I walk down the stairs to the front door and then turn on the porch light. It looks right and he's in full uniform. Please let me in. We got a 911 call from this house. Did you call 911? I reply back with, um, I was asleep. I didn't call 911. And he then says back, Hurry up. Someone called. There was breathing on the line for five minutes, and then the line went dead. I just reply again with, Sir, I'm the only one here. I didn't call 911. Well, open the door and let me check, he says, and he starts looking at me with a lot of fear in his eyes. I told him that the front door is broken and that you can only lock it from outside. 
He walks all the way around to the backside door and to the pitch black of night. I open the door and I let him inside, where he asks to use the phone. He tells me that he's going to call the 911 operator just to make sure this is the right house first. This is 6220, right? And I tell him yes it is. I hand him the phone from the living room. He calls, and I hear her identify as 911 when it's answered. He gives her his badge number, and he tells her he needs to check that this is the phone that made the 911 call. I hear her reply yes, that that's indeed the number, and reads it back. He then looks at me, and I answer, yeah, that's the number, and she reads the address to him. He looks at me again, and once again I reply, yeah, that's my address. He tells her what's happening, and that he's going to do a search. The operator then asks if he needs any kind of backup, and he just says no and hangs up. He hands me the phone, and Oscar runs down the stairs, meowing loud and scaring the both of us. Are you sure you're alone here? He asks me. He steps in super close to me, and he bends down to whisper in my ear. Ma'am, are you being held here against your will? And I back up and say, No, it's just me and the cat here. I don't think the cat knows how to use the phone. He then just laughs, and he tells me not to move. Look, I'm going to search the house. He pulls out his gun, and he goes room to room clearing it, both upstairs and downstairs. I stand there and watch. He comes back downstairs, then saying, Well, you're right. You are alone. And I reply back with, Just me and the cat. He smiles and uses his handset to let them know that there's nothing else going on here and that he cleared the house. He then checks with me one more time that I'm safe. I tell him, yeah, I'm all good. I'm probably not going to sleep for the rest of the night, but I'm good. I walk him out and he turns and says, call back if you need me and lock this door. I'm going to stay around the area tonight if I can. And I then smiled, closed the door and locked it. What the fuck just happened? How did my bedroom door get closed and locked? How did our house phone call 911? And why was there breathing? Was I sleepwalking? Was someone actually in my house? What the fuck happened? Yeah, that was a really strange night.